Hi, students. Uh, today's lecture, or this this lecture, is uh, over chapter twelve. which is based on temperature and heat. All right, so this is the first uh, lecture on the new theory of thermal physics that we're, we're doing in this class. So we have completed the theory of mechanics. And so thermal physics is now going to be um, the, uh, the topic. Now we're going to we're going to uh, achieve this in a way that's similar and also different than uh, what we did before with um, with uh, mechanics. All right. So again, we're in, we're in a new theory. So there's certain um, aspects that we're going to do the same way, and other aspects that will be pretty much done backwards. So let's talk about the similarity. All right, so we kind of go back. We've done an entire theory of physics so far. So we talked about mechanics and now the new theory is thermal physics. Thermal physics is going to be um, phenomena. They're going to, so thermal physics is really going to be, I guess to kind of sum it up a little bit. Thermal physics will be the physics that involves concepts such as temperature and heat, just as the, as the um, today's topics imply. So now we did not employ any of those concepts so far. We haven't needed to. So you know we've been we've been solving a whole variety of physics problems, talking about objects of motion. But as we understand, heat and temperature are also very important uh, aspects of our physical world. And so, and, but they do not fall into the context of mechanics. They fall into a new theory. They are governed by different laws of physics. They're not governed by Newton's laws and the conservation of energy. They're governed by what are called the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, so we have an entire new range of physical phenomena, hence a new theory with new laws. Now, mechanics, what are we doing that's similar? So let's just kind of talk about similar approach. So we're doing similarly is we're starting off by talking about, what do we do in mechanics? Well, we talked about what was tangible first. So, so basically we, we started off by saying, so what, so what we're gonna do that's the same. So let's just kind of uh, maybe make this a little bit different here. So, um, so we're going to do some things that are the same approach. So same, same approach, and then we'll talk about the opposite approach. Okay, so mechanics versus thermal physics. Well, mechanics, remember how we did this. We started out by talking about what we can observe. We observe objects in motion. I mean, that's how we started off. Chapters, chapters two and three, we talked about, well, we, we can form uh, what are called, what, you know, what is called kinematics. We don't know why uh, objects move, but we observe that they move. And then we implement, and we, we can also implement, you know, we start implementing the laws of physics. In this case, Newton's laws. We also introduce the concept of, um, and that, that includes also the concept of um, conservation of energy. Okay, so we have to first observe and then we ask the why questions. Well, in thermal physics, we're gonna do the same thing. We observe that, um, we observe that um, that um, environments have a temperature and 
uh, objects or substances change because of temperature. Never change temperature. So substances change. Just observations. So how, how might they change while well, they could expand or contract? All right, and then they can have phase changes. And then we'll do the laws of physics. And we'll see that there are what we call the laws of thermodynamics. Now we took what? Uh, 11 chapters to do mechanics. Thermal physics will be done in um, uh, four chapters, chapter 12 through 15. By the time we get to chapter 15, chapter 15 will be entirely based on the laws of thermodynamics. All right, and so we have you know similar approaches and different approaches. Now, what's opposite? So again, you know, and, and, and then again, tangible in uh, in thermal fit and thermal physics means taking a temperature. That's how we measure something. We take a temperature. That's what we call tangible. Now, what's what's the opposite approach? Well, with mechanics. We started looking at, so we looked or we observed and or we studied the players or the constituents then we employed energy concepts. Well, for thermal physics, we can't look at the actual players or the constituents. They're atoms. So in fact, in thermal physics, we actually, actually the pure thermodynamics is an energy theory. So we begin with energy. We have no choice. We do not even know, we do not have confirmation of the actual existence of atoms until 1830. And I kind of will talk about this. This is a this is a observation or experiment done by Robert Brown, who was actually a botanist who actually discovered uh, that atoms exist. You know, it was actually hot contention whether atoms actually existed or not. Some people were believed very deeply in atoms, and others uh, were strongly opposed to the existence of atoms. Finally, we talk about what's called a kinetic theory of gases. Which basically, you know, is an atomic or molecular theory. Okay, so finally we have an atomic molecular theory. But we have to do things the opposite way because we can't, back in the 1700s, we can't have, and we have no way of even knowing if atoms exist. So we have a pure energy theory. Finally, we get to atoms. So it's the exact opposite. Here we can see, we can see, you know, uh, projectiles, cannonballs. We, you know, we can see things in motion. And we, then we can employ the energy concept. So again, things are done in an opposite way if you're considering, you know, um, talking about the constituents and then talking about the energy concepts. So again, there's a different approach involved here. But again, at the same time, we're going to end up 
we're going to end up with a full theory that is, that explains everything. All right. And so, so again, this is uh, how we're going to uh, accomplish the study of, of mechanics. Try to see if I can actually get more on my whiteboard here. Why it's not behaving. All right. Okay, so um let's get going. So we start off again talking about um a brand new theory, and we, we're gonna talk about just making observations. So the way make the make a way to make observations with thermal physics is to take a temperature. Okay, so so again, you know, one of the things that we we constantly will um, you know come in, come in, in touch with in, in physics is we have concepts that we think we're familiar with, we think we understand, but it turns out we really don't know what it is at all. One of them is temperature. The temperature is a number. We take it as just a, a number that tells us how hot something is. And so we use this as a litmus test, if you will. I mean, if I, if I, even if you're a kid, if I were to go and tell you first thing in the morning that, oh, it's going to be a, a high of 95 degrees Fahrenheit today, you would automatically know. All I told you is a number. You'd automatically know that you'd be, you'd need to dress for hot weather. You know, wear shorts or or t-shirt. If I were to tell you, you know, say for instance, first thing in the morning that no, the high is going to be 35 degrees Fahrenheit today. Then you would know the dress for cold weather, wear, wear a coat, wear longer pants, you know? And so, all, and all I've told you is a number. What does that number actually mean? Well, it turns out that this number, temperature, is actually a measure of thermal energy. So temperature, is a measure, it's not energy itself. It is a measure of the uh, average kinetic energy which we can call the thermal energy of the constituents in a substance. Now, we're currently in chapter 12. When we get to chapter 14, I will prove this for gases. We'll actually be advanced enough to have, it, to have our first atomic molecular theory. Right now, we don't. Right now, we're in a situation where, yes, we live in the 21st century and we know that atoms exist, but we have to pretend that we go back to the 1700s where we did not know that atoms exist, and that we have to deal with a pure energy theory. All right, and so with that said, we have to take the temperature as a measure of heat, and I'll talk about what heat is in a moment. We have to take a temperature as just a number, and just like we, most people do. And then we'll we'll talk a little bit later, you know, how we can tie that in with with the most with uh, average thermal energy. All right. So right now, like anybody else, we have to just take a temperature and look at temperature scales. <clears throat> so with temperature, we have to we have different temperature scales that are that we have to have that are well defined, so so we can communicate with anybody else in the world. Now, the whole world. The world except the United States uses uh, the Celsius temperature scale. In fact, the Celsius temperature scale is 
the official SI temperature scale. Okay, so that's um, <clears throat> that's the official temperature scale of the SI system. Now, um, <clears throat> so it's based it is based on the, the freezing and boiling points of water. So very intelligent. It is a basically a, a, let's say I get what I call it, power of ten scale. So it's metric. based on the freezing and boiling points of water. So water is about the most important substance of humankind. And so why not use water as a way as as a, a, a way of uh, indicating it, or why not base the temperature scale on the important aspects or, or the point, the important uh, phase changes or phase points of water. All right, so that makes sense. You know, it's convenient to we humans, and so we pick a temperature scale. So essentially, we know that zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water, and nice uh, zero to hundred scale, hundred degrees Celsius is boiling. Water exists as a liquid between zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. Again, you know, you all walked into this class knowing this, but but um, the important thing is to understand that that is the basis of our temperature scale. It is based on the freezing and boiling point of water. One second. Please. Okay, so now, however, in the United States, we use this uh, scale called the Fahrenheit scale. Okay, and the Fahrenheit scale, now here, here the Celsius scale is based upon the boiling and freezing point of pure water. Now, the Fahrenheit, and it has nice numbers, zero, zero for freezing, 100 for boiling. Well, the Celsius scale is one we use in the United States, and it's kind of, I don't know how it came, up, came to be, the, uh, the accepted temperature scale. But I mean, I looked it up one time, you know, we, we, you know, we use, so the United States used, primarily uses the Fahrenheit scale. The US uses the Fahrenheit temperature scale. And in that scale, we have weird numbers like 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing. And 212 Fahrenheit is boiling. And I've always wondered, like, you know, I wonder wondering one time, what does this scale based on? Well, it's based, it's based upon the freezing and boiling points. of a brine solution. Now, the question would be then, what brine solution, right? You have to actually cook up or concoct together the appropriate brine solution. So how this became the uh, temperature scale in use is beyond me, but again, it's not my decision, but it's a scale that we use in this country. And so again, if you have, if you, have um, you know, you generally physicists work and chemists and any other scientists work in the Celsius scale, and then if you have an American customer, you can you can at the very end you convert to the the Fahrenheit scale, and so there's a nice easy way of doing that. And essentially, the the way of doing it would be well, your temperature in Fahrenheit, your temperature in Fahrenheit. Again, 
hopefully you saw this before you came in this class, is nine fifths the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 32. So nice linear relationship between the two. Well, let's test that. Temperature, let's, let's test uh, freezing. Do this works? Well, we would set T sub C equal to zero. That knocks out the whole first term. T sub F is, is automatically 32. Yep. We see that. How about boiling? Well, T sub C is 100. Put 100 in here, 9 fifths times 100 is 180. Plus 32 is 212. Yeah, check. We have we have the uh, endpoints and it works. So this is the relationship between you know going from if I know if I know Celsius I can get Fahrenheit. I can go the other direction quite easily. Very simple algebra that would, that would take me there. I would say well nine fifths temperature Celsius is T Fahrenheit minus 32. Right. I just subtract 32 and then multiply both sides by five ninths. So I could have that T Celsius is five ninths times the quantity T Fahrenheit minus 32. So again, going both ways, if I know Fahrenheit, I can get Celsius. If I know Celsius, I can get Fahrenheit. And this is something that hopefully you've seen before you came to this class. But again, there's a nice, easy way of looking at this. Now to keep in mind here is that in T Celsius, I literally go from, we literally go from freezing to boiling in only a hundred increments. Whereas T Fahrenheit, we go from freezing to boiling in 180 increments. So the, the difference between in temperature between uh, in, in, a, in a degree Fahrenheit is smaller by a factor of 1.8 than it is for temperature Celsius. So they're on a different scale. Okay, so if you were to put them on a slope, they'd have a different slope. They're on a different scale, right? Now, that's Fahrenheit and Celsius. Now, the thing is, as we get smarter, we realize that, well, we can, even though water is a very important substance to humankind, once we understood atoms, we understand that, for instance, that the, the temperature is really a, a measure of the average thermal energy of the constituents that make up the substance. So if I increase the temperature, that means the average energy or average thermal energy or average kinetic energy of the constituents increases. Well, if I reduce the temperature, it means the average kinetic energy of the substances reduces. Well, let me reduce it more and more and more, lower and lower temperature. In that case, I should have a lower and lower kinetic energy, uh, average kinetic energy of the, of, the, of the constituents. Might there be a temperature that's so low that the constituents cease to move? We would refer to that as absolute zero. Now, in reality, if you take in the, into account quantum theory, there are always what are called vacuum fluctuations, quantum fluctuations. Quantum fluctuations, even in pure emptiness, there will always be quantum fluctuations. In fact, uh, as theoretical physics points out, the very beginning of this universe what, uh, started from a very unusually large quantum fluctuation that became the Big Bang. So quantum fluctuations are indeed significant. But if we take quantum mechanics out of the picture for the moment, we're back in the 1700s, we would say that at absolute zero, Um, uh, you know, um, according to, we'll say, we'll say, according to classical mechanics, we're not going to, so without, without considering quantum theory, an absolute zero. Um, uh, the constituents of a substance cease to move. At 
absolute zero occurs at a temperature of negative 273 degrees Celsius. So it's very, very, very cold, very low temperature. Well, then we ask ourselves the question, hmm, if that's the case, if we can, if, you know, why, even though water is a very important substance to humankind, a more advanced understanding would indicate that we ought to not, not to have the temperature scale depend on substance at all. We should have it depend on the thermal energy of matter. We should set zero to be this absolute zero temperature in which objects cease to move. And so that's the, that is what we call the Kelvin temperature. We would say that this temperature corresponds to uh, a T Kelvin of, of zero. This corresponds to T Kelvin equals zero. So hypothetically, I could say that my Kelvin temperature is equal to my Celsius temperature plus 273. So if I'm at negative 273 degrees Celsius, negative 273 plus 273 is zero, that's zero Kelvin, which means the freezing point of water which I referred to as 100 degrees Celsius, 100 plus 273 is three, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, zero degrees Celsius, I apologize. Uh, freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius, so zero plus 273 is 273. 273 Kelvin corresponds to freezing point of water. Boiling point of water would be 100 degrees Celsius, or 100 plus 273 is 373. Now the nice thing about the Kelvin temperature scale and the Celsius scale is that they have the same uh, they, they have the same scale factor. So one degree, so one increment in degree Celsius is the same as one increment in degree Kelvins, which is not the case for Fahrenheit. Remember, Fahrenheit has a different size increment. So literally, the Kelvin scale and the Celsius scale are different by an offset, which makes it very, very convenient and very easy to perform the, uh, the necessary um, conversions. I don't, need, I don't need to do any multiplications or divisions. I literally just add and subtract 273. Now, in reality, this number is really 273.15. But in this class, 273 is usually perfectly okay. I mean, I'll, in some of my calculus, I'll do two, I guess I should be official and say this is 273.15. That's really the official thing. But anyway, 273 for the most part in this class is fine. Now, we're going to find out that. Um, I'm going to, there are four laws of thermodynamics that govern, um, four laws of physics that govern thermal physics. We call them the laws of thermodynamics. So what's interesting is that, you know, when we get to chapter 15, we'll be talking about the first law and the second law of thermodynamics all over and over again. But it turns out that, I think it was Rudolf Clausius, who later on realized that taking the temperature was not something to be taken for granted. Actually, it is a law of thermodynamics that when you take a temperature, you're not, so when you, take, when you have a thermometer, for instance, you're not taking the temperature, like let's say for you, you take a temperature of, let's say a, a child, let's say a child is sick and you, you take his or her temperature. You're not taking the temperature of the child. You're taking the temperature of the thermometer. The thermometer takes a temperature of itself. So we find out that when you take a temperature, um, when we take a temperature, heat is transferred. That's an energy. Heat is transferred. And I'll talk about heat in a moment. Heat is, um, which is an energy. Heat is um, uh, energy transfer due to a temperature change. I'll officially define it in a little bit. It's energy difference, I should say. So heat, which is energy transfer due to a temperature difference, is transferred. from 
a hotter body to a colder body until both bodies have the same final temperature. At which point they are said to be in thermal equilibrium. That is a behavior of the universe that is always true, that does not have a more, uh, a more primary cause. The fact that heat transfers from a hotter body to a colder body until thermal equilibrium is achieved is how you take a temperature. You can't do anything in thermal dynamics before you take a temperature. So we'll, we'll talk about the law, first law and second law of thermodynamics, but what was overlooked accidentally was the very fact that you can take a temperature is, is is um is a law of physics so when you take when you put a thermal when you put a thermometer in your mouth for instance while your body is, is at a certain temperature the thermometer is initially cold well your body is so big compared with the metal head and the thermometer your body will lose heat but it, it's considered a, what's called a, a thermal reservoir so it's so large that even though it loses heat and sufficient heat to make the thermometer at the same temperature as your body it's not significant enough of a loss of heat to change the temperature to change your body's temperature. So the thermometer will, as you if you notice, you know, you have, you have a thermometer, usually you have to wait for it to settle. And eventually some thermometers will have like a little, a little uh, ringing noise it'll make. And that and that that tells you that the thermometer has reached an equilibrium. The thermometer has reached a temperature, its temperature, it's taking its temperature, and it's just it's just basically stopping when the temperature and the thermal equilibrium is achieved when its temperature no longer is changing and by and by a certain law of physics that temperature happens to be the same as your as the temperature of your body so rudolf clausius kind of pointed out to the community kind of like uh, guys um i think we forgot a law of physics and yeah, I know we've been talking about the first law and the second law over and over again for years, but we can't really call this the third law because it, it, it naturally precedes the first and second laws. So what do we do? Well, what they did is they referred to it, they called it the zeroth law of thermodynamics. They couldn't automatically get out their eraser after they published so many papers and wrote so many books about this first law and second law, they couldn't just get their eraser and say, hey guys, let's go and change all of our books. They had to go and, and essentially in kind of an embarrassing way, they had to kind of stick in this law, this, this most basic law of thermodynamics uh, be before all the other ones. So this brings us to the addition of our very first law of thermodynamics which we have to talk about here because otherwise we can't take a temperature. Okay, so temperature is the basic way of calculating. So we have what's called a zeroth law of thermodynamics. One of the embarrassments of physics. And it reads a lot like the transitive property of algebra. All right, if two systems A and B are in thermal equilibrium with each other, and I explain what thermal equilibrium meant.
And B is in thermal equilibrium with the third system C. With A, third system C. Okay, then A is also in, th in thermal equilibrium with C. So it reads like a transitive property of algebra. Two systems, A and B, are in thermal equilibrium with each other. And B is in thermal equilibrium with a third system, C. Then A is also in thermal equilibrium with C. Okay, all this really means is that thermal equilibrium is a, is a general property. Depends on, you know, two objects have different temperatures. They will, they, and they're in contact one, with one another. They will, they will have heat transfer until they, a thermal equilibrium is achieved. This is how you take a temperature. Okay, so the most basic uh, property of thermodynamics is taking the temperature. Okay, and then, so, um, all right, so that's, and talking about, uh, that's the zero law. So it, it kind of gives you an idea of how great Isaac Newton was. So here you have this, you know, group of brilliant physicists. They included James Clerk Maxwell, Rudolf Clausius, and Josiah Willard Gibbs, and Ludwig Boltzmann, these great physicists. Yet together, they couldn't get all the laws of thermodynamics right. Isaac Newton by himself thought all three of the laws of, of motion and got them in the right order. So again, this tells you the absolute unbelievable intellect of Isaac Newton, just how his, his understanding of the physical universe. Now, I talked about I talked about the uh, there are four laws of thermodynamics. Well, most of chapter fifteen will talk about the first and second law. Um, chapter basically, I can give you the third law of thermodynamics right now because I talked about absolute zero. So, third law of thermodynamics is kind of a more of a modern law. I'll kind of give this to you right now. And it's pretty easy to state. It is impossible for a system to achieve a temperature. of absolute zero. Or basically T equals zero Kelvin. No system has ever, ever, ever been found to be taken down to zero Kelvin. You can asymptotically achieve it, but you cannot, I mean, you can asymptotically approach it, but you can never achieve zero Kelvin. Now, there's nothing we can do with it. We don't have a we don't have a, we don't have a, a mathematical statement that goes along with this. But this is again a law of physics, uh, which is a behavior of the universe that is always true, uh, but does not have a more primary cause. So no system has ever been known to be taken down to zero Kelvin. So so far we're only in our first you know uh, for, you know first minutes of uh, thermal physics, and we already have two laws of of thermodynamics. We'll wait for the other two laws in chapter 15, all right? Okay, so now we're going back to, I mean, I, I can throw this law in there at, at, at any time. Since we're talking about absolute zero and temperature scales, I might as well throw it in now. So again, it, we're not ever gonna use this law of thermodynamics, but again, it is something that we should know about. The third law. So we have the zeroth law and the third law, and we need to wait until chapter 15 before we talk about the first and the second laws, all right? So. 
Okay, so now when we see objects changing temperature, one of the things that you'll notice is they expand or contract. And so we have what is called uh, linear thermal expansion. So there's an empirical formula that basically says how much an object will expand. Well, we're going to start off with talking about one dimension. How much an object will expand, let's say a long skinny object will expand in one dimension because of a temperature change. So the, the uh, empirical formula, there's nothing for me to derive here. The empirical formula that states this is the change in, a, so I imagine an object that's a certain length. Long skinny object, it has a certain length, L, we'll call it L naught. And, it's, and we observe this length at a temperature T naught. We raise the temperature some T1. We realize that the object gets a little bit longer. Okay, so now the object is, a, is different by some delta L. Okay, and we're seeing that this, that this new length occurs at T1. All I've done is change the temperature. We'll say, generally, we'll say that T1 temperature greater than T0. Well, this empirical formula basically states that delta L is L not alpha delta T. Okay, L, L not is the original length of the object. You're changing it by temperature delta T. Delta T is T1 minus T0. Alpha is an empirical value. It's called the coefficient of linear expansion. It is material dependent. What are its units? Well, let's see. I have a length and a length, okay? So what's left over is that, well, I already have, you know, length, so I have to have these two, alpha delta T have, have got to multiply together to give me unity, unitless number. Well, delta T is a temperature, then alpha has got to be an inverse temperature. So alpha should have units of, so alpha should have units of, um, Units of alpha should be per degree Celsius or per Kelvin, basically per a temperature. All right, so you have to go and look up at a table to figure out what the coefficients of expansion are. So and again, this is empirically determined. In fact, if we were meeting face to face, we would actually do this very lab. So let me, uh, give me a second. I'm gonna go to the uh, table real quick and then we'll, I'll share my screen. Your book should have such a table. I'm going to the, uh, I'm in OpenStax. Hang on one second. All right, so let me share. So I'm, this is OpenStax, uh, looks like what, what page is this? So if you've downloaded OpenStax, I'm on page, uh, four eighty. I'm on page four eighty of OpenStax. And so essentially what you'll see is that every single Every single um, substance has an, a coefficient of, uh, of linear expansion. And so the middle, so the middle, um, uh, the middle column is alpha, 
which I just get done giving you. So what we see here is this is per temperature, this is per, per degree Celsius. So aluminum, you know, you see the metals, you know, they have, they, you know, they have, a, they have a, you know, various, you know, some, some expand more than others, like Invar doesn't expand so much as others. Then you notice that gases and liquids and gases, um, we don't really have an alpha per se, we're going to talk in a moment about volume expansion. We're going to talk about, in a moment about expansion in three dimensions, and we use beta for that. And we'll find out that in general, the the coefficient of, of volume expansion is about is three times that of linear expansion. So the volume expansion would be imagining an object expanding in three dimensions. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you'll notice that here, you know, you have you know some number times ten negative six for solids, and you get the liquids, they expand more and gases expand the most. So again, that makes sense, you know, gases are very compressible, all right? So you have to go to a table to look these numbers up. Now, let me stop sharing for a moment. And so again, I talked about volume expansion. Well, volume expansion is just a three-dimensional analog to linear expansion. So again, you're talking about in a volume, volume expansion, you're talking about something expanding in three dimensions. So we would call this thermal expansion in three dimensions. And so we would imagine that something would have some sort of a volume, maybe like a sphere, at a temperature. So let's say we have some sort of a V naught volume at a temperature T T zero, and then we allow the temperature to increase, and let's say you know increases to a new volume. And this is exaggerated. Let's say you know the new volume is going to have a volume, let's say V1 now at a temperature T1, right? And so it's ex it's it's expanded. And I would say that the formula, it's empirical again, would be the delta V change in the volume is the initial volume beta delta T. It looks very familiar. Beta is again another empirical value it is the um coefficient of volume expansion and it also has units of per degree uh, per you know temperature per degree celsius and typically, as we saw on the table, typically beta is about equal to three alpha. And these have to be determined empirically. Okay, this is an empirical formula. I've not derived anything. All right, so this is how, now you have, when you're doing some engineering, let, let's say for instance, you're making railroad tracks or something, you have to allow, or let's say you're making a sidewalk. If you walk, if you walk in a sidewalk, you'll notice that on the sidewalk, there's always those little spacers. So when you walk in a sidewalk, for instance, let's say there's a sidewalk, what do you see? Well, you'll see little squares. To walk along, there's a little spacer. You have the next square of concrete in your sidewalk and then a little spacer and then the next one. And you wonder why are these little spacers? So these little spacers are because the concrete expands on a hot day. Like today, you know, you lay down the concrete, you have to ask yourself, you know, historical data, how cold does Fort Worth get? And how hot does Fort Worth get? And I wanna allow for, I wanna allow for the most extreme case that we've seen in history about a volume expansion. I wanna see, I wanna, I wanna design the sidewalk so that it is allowed to expand. If I don't allow it to expand, it's going to, it's either gonna warp or it's gonna break. You have to do that for laying down, let's say rails on a railroad, laying down, you have to allow spacers on a sidewalk. You have to allow for thermal expansion when you build something, okay? And so that's very important. 
All right, so let's do a few problems out of OpenStax. Get our feet wet. Now in OpenStax, even though we're on chapter 12 in, um, in our book, we're, we would already be on chapter 13 in OpenStax. So we're sort of OpenStax. Remember chapter 12 was, was uh, fluid dynamics in OpenStax, right? So, so we're gonna be in OpenStax 13.1. All right, and that says, what is the Fahrenheit? So we're going to start off basic. What is the Fahrenheit temperature? Okay, um, of a person. with a 39.0 degrees Celsius fever. So someone comes up to you and has a temperature of 39.0 degrees Celsius, that person is said to have a fever. What is that temperature in uh, Fahrenheit? So how do you do it? Well, you go back to that age old formula, T sub Fahrenheit is nine fifths, T sub Celsius plus 32, okay? T Fahrenheit is nine fifths <clears throat> times 39 plus 32. And if you do that, you'll find out the Fahrenheit temperature that that person would have is 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. So in our, if someone said, I'm running 102.2, well, that you have a fever, okay? So in Celsius, that person would be running at 39. Uh, Celsius. Okay, uh, next problem. Okay, open stacks. 10 light bulb filament this actually surprised me a lot the first time I did this problem uh, may operate I had no idea it was this hot at 2900 Kelvin That's uh, that's actually incredible to me. What is its Fahrenheit temperature? All right, and what is this on the Celsius scale? Okay, 2,900 Kelvin, that's, um, that's amazing. So anyway, that's our Kelvin temperature we have to work with. We're gonna convert that to Fahrenheit and Celsius. So I would say it makes more sense to go to Celsius first and then go to Fahrenheit. So we would say that T Celsius is T Kelvin minus 273.15, I guess I'll go official. All right, so, T Celsius is 2900 minus 273.15. T Celsius would then be 2626.85 degrees Celsius, or I'll just round it to 2627. That's uh, incredible. 26, 27 degrees Celsius, the filament of the tungsten filament. <clears throat> so what is that in Fahrenheit? <clears throat> well, we go and put it into that formula. All right, so 
T Fahrenheit is nine fifths T Celsius plus 32. T Fahrenheit is nine fifths. We have 2627 plus 32 T Fahrenheit. We would find out is 4761 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. 4761 degrees Fahrenheit. There you go. So again, real basic problems to start off. But again, we have to start somewhere. <clears throat> this is actually a who wants to be a millionaire question. 13.8. The next one. So OpenStax 13.8 says, at what temperature um, do the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales have the same numerical value? Okay, and then um, <clears throat> B, at what temperature uh, do the Fahrenheit and Kelvin scales have the same numerical value? Okay, so 13.8 open stacks, what temperature do the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales have the same numerical value? That part A was the, uh, was actually the who wants to be, be a millionaire question, by the way. <clears throat> and then B, what temperature do, uh, do the Fahrenheit and Kelvin scales have the same numerical value? All right, so how do you do that? Part A, what do we say? Well, we know that T Fahrenheit, is nine fifths T Celsius plus 32. We're gonna assume that they have the same numerical value. I'll let that value be A. So we're gonna say A is nine fifths A plus 32. Whatever that value is, it's gonna be the same. I'll just call it A. Subtract nine fifths of both sides. I'll have negative four fifths A is 32 and I worked that out, I found out that A is negative 40. So negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as negative 40 degrees Celsius. That is where they overlap. So the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scales will read the same at that one temperature. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so what about uh, Kelvin? We know when they, so the segment, the Fahrenheit and Kelvin scales, when are they the same? Well, again, we'll start off with the formula that we had before. We'll say, well, we know that T Fahrenheit is T Celsius, oh, I'm sorry, 9 is T Celsius plus 32. But we, now we got to put in the, um, the transformation for, uh, for uh, Kelvin. So T Celsius, okay, remember, is T Kelvin minus 273.15. So we'll substitute for T Celsius. So that means that T Fahrenheit will be nine fifths quantity T Kelvin minus 273.15 plus 32. 
So T Fahrenheit is nine fifths T Kelvin minus, we've got to multiply nine fifths times 273.15. Uh, when you, um, yeah, I guess you, when you do that and add 32, you find out that you get 459.67. The multiply nine fifths uh, times the negative 273.15 and I added 32 afterwards. That's what I get. Now you want them to have the same numerical value, right? We're gonna play the same game. A is nine fifths A minus 459.67. Or negative four fifths A is negative four fifty nine point six seven. Or we find out that uh, A is equal to five seventy four point six. So five hundred and seventy four point six degrees Fahrenheit is five seventy four. Point six Kelvin. All right, so that's where they so very very high temperature there. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so um, next, we're going to talk about some thermal expansion problem. We'll do um, Opus X thirteen point nine. We have uh, the height of the Washington Monument. Okay, is uh, measured to be 170 meters. On a day <clears throat> um, when the temperature is 35.0 degrees Celsius, or 35 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, what will be its height? on a day when the temperature falls to negative 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, although the monument is made of limestone, Assume that it's thermal coefficient expansion. Uh, is the same as marble. All right, so here we go. The height of the Washington Monument is measured to be 170 meters on a day when the temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. What will its height, uh, what will be its height, sorry, on a day when the temperature falls to negative 10 degrees Celsius, although the monument is made of limestone, assume that the thermal coefficient expansion is the same as that of marble. All right, so how do we do this? Well, again, we're gonna use this empirical formula for thermal expansion. So we 
write down what we know. Well, the, again, the formula that we're gonna use is the empirical delta L is L naught alpha delta T. So, so what do we, so what is that? Well, L naught is the temperature at T naught is 35 degrees Celsius. We're told that it's 170 degrees Celsius at T naught is 35 degrees Celsius. And we want to figure out, you know, we're going to allow delta T. Now let's be very careful here. Delta T, remember, is going to be, so we know that we're going to look at a final temperature T1, which is negative 10 degrees Celsius. So delta T is going to be T1 minus T0, or negative 10 degrees Celsius minus 35 degrees Celsius. That's a change of negative 45 degrees Celsius. Again, negative sign is very important here because otherwise your answer is going to be totally wrong. You're actually having a not a thermal expansion, but actually a thermal contraction. All right. And so if you come up, if you're trying to expand this, you're going to have the wrong answer. All right. So that's my delta T. And I know my L naught. So the only other thing I have to do is I look up thermal expansion coefficient of marbles. I go to that table I just showed you. And when I look that up, I find out that's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius. Again, and one thing you have to look at is you have to make sure that your units match. So I have temperatures in degrees Celsius, my thermal expansion coefficients per degree Celsius, so that matches, that's good. And it's a matter then of just uh, putting it in. So my delta L is gonna be L naught alpha delta T, so it's 170 meters times the alpha, which is 2.5, times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius. And then my delta T is negative 45 degrees Celsius. I find out that my delta L, my change in length, will be negative, it's pretty small, 0 0.019 meters. So what am I being asked? I'm being asked what will be its height on this day when the temperature is negative 10 degrees Celsius. So I'm asking about an L1, which is L naught plus delta L, right? And so that's gonna be 170 meters minus, now the delta L is negative, 0 0.019 meters. So the height will not be 170, it'll be pretty close to it though, 169.98 meters. So I don't have to really worry about much. Not going to shrink by much. It's like uh, marble's a good thing to make the building on. There you go. That's its height on that cold day. It's going to shrink just a little bit. Okay, another thermal expansion problem. Let's do the 13.12. Open stacks. 13.12. That says, how large an expansion gap should be left? between steel railroad rails if they may reach a match in temperature they may reach a maximum temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, 35.0 degrees Celsius, greater than when they were laid.
Their original length is 10.0 meters. So again, 13.12 open stacks. How large an expansion gap? Should be left between steel railroad rails if they may reach a maximum temperature of 35 degrees Celsius greater than when they were laid. The original length was 10 point sharp meters. So again, when you're when you're an engineer, you're somebody trying to trying to uh, lay down something like railroad tracks. You have to understand historically how hot may it get. You want to allow the rails to expand. If you don't allow for that expansion, those rails will warp. You'll have a great disaster. They will warp. There's examples of that. You need to allow for thermal expansion. That'd be a great, great disaster. So um, let's work this out here. So we're being told here that my L naught, so again, what's my what's my going formula? Delta L is L naught alpha delta T. All right, L naught, we're told that when the rails were laid, they were each 10 meters long, okay? And we're talking about now delta T, we're, we're asking about a temperature of allowing for a temperature increase of 35 degrees Celsius over when the temperature in which they were, they were laid. So delta T will simply be 35 degrees Celsius. We're, we're, we're talking about a difference in temperature, a positive difference in temperature. And I gotta look up alpha for steel. I go to that table, look up alpha for steel, I find out that's gonna be 12 times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius for steel. Very important that the, these railroad uh, rails are made out of steel. And then it's just a matter of saying, well, how much do I expect it to expand? Delta L, L naught, 10.0 meters. Alpha. 12 times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius, change the temperature, 35 degrees Celsius. Delta L will be 4.2 times 10 to the negative three meters, which is 4.2 millimeter. That's actually pretty significant. 4.2 millimeters, that, that's definitely noticeable. All right, um, I'm going to do another expansion, but I'll do a volume expansion this time. All right, I'm going to do open stacks 13.7. All right, this says uh, A. If a 500 milliliter glass beaker is filled to the brim with ethyl alcohol. At a five at a five point at, at five point zero zero degrees Celsius. How much will overflow? When the temperature reaches 22.0 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then B, 
how much less water, so how much less water would overflow under the same condition. All right, so what's this mean? Well, you have a beaker completely, totally full to the brim with some sort of a substance. Now, given that you're having a temperature change, you're gonna have volume expansion. Well, you already have max capacity on the volume as far as the beaker is concerned. So volume expansion just basically means that the, that the substance is gonna overflow the beaker. And so we're gonna we're gonna try to figure out how much of this how much substance overflows when that when that substance in the beaker is ethyl alcohol compared with just regular water. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So part A. Well, the given formula this time is gonna be V or I'm sorry delta V change in the volume is initial volume beta delta t okay, it looks similar but we have to look at it different that's the rightmost column in that table i showed you that's the that's the volume of that's the the, the coefficient of volume expansion all right and so well let's see v naught is 500 milliliters Okay, of whatever, whatever substance. That's the alcohol in the first place, water in the second place. Delta T, while we're raising temperature, right? It's going to be T final minus T initial, or 22.0 degrees Celsius minus set minus five degrees Celsius, which is 17.0 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's my delta T, positive. Um, so that, that's what I know. And now I have to look up beta for ethyl alcohol. So I go to look at the table and I find out for ethyl alcohol, beta is equal to 1100 uh, times 10 negative six per degree Celsius, ethyl alcohol. All right, and so what do I have? Well, delta V is gonna be the overflow volume, right? So delta V is gonna be V naught, well, it's V naught is 500 milliliters, beta 1100 times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius, delta T is 17.0 degrees Celsius. When I do this, I find out the volume expansion is going to simply be 9.35 milliliters. That's how much will overflow the beaker. All right, so keep that in mind, 9.35 milliliters. Now, basically gonna do the same problem again, except we're gonna change the expansion coefficient. Now we're gonna talk about water. All right, so I'm just gonna erase the last couple lines. We'll then have a new expansion coefficient for water. And all of this is completely the same, same conditions. Water though, has a uh, smaller expansion coefficient. So beta for water will be 210 times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius. That's for water. Do the same calculation, uh, delta V is, 500 milliliters, V naught beta, smaller beta now, 210 times 10 to the negative six per degree Celsius times the same temperature difference, 17 degrees Celsius. Come to find out that V delta V now will be 1.79 milliliters. So it wants to know what the change is with the difference will simply be what I, what I did in A compared to what I got in B. The alcohol, ethyl alcohol and water will be 9.35 uh, 
um, milliliters minus um, 1.79 milliliters. And the difference is that there will be um, 7.56 7 milliliters less water. So the thing less water will spill over in the case of um, uh, in, in this particular experiment compared to the ethyl alcohol. Okay. So now, um, We move on to uh, another topic. So now we're, we're talking about how um, objects or substances can expand or contract with temperature change. Well, anybody knows that, let's say for instance, if you're sitting in the classroom, let's say we're meeting face to face and let's say, instead of, instead of being July, it's like November or maybe December, well, maybe November, we're still in school at that point in time. And let's say for instance, I tell you, well, uh, the temperature is now, I don't know, 37 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's going to start raining. And by the end of class, temperature is supposed to get down to maybe 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, you've been around long enough to realize, uh-oh, I have to drive home in this. And the temperature is getting below freezing. That means I may have a little difficult time driving home if some of that liquid water turns into solid water, i.e. snow or ice, right? And so you know, just from your experience that temperature change on substances causes phase change, all right? And so that's another experience, that's another, that's another um, observation that we know about, is that temperature change causes phase changes. And so if we study that um, in, uh, in, in depth, we can realize that we can make a phase diagram which is basically a um, pressure temperature diagram. for any substance. We can make a map. We can say for a given temperature and pressure, what is the phase? Let me give you, an, let me give you a, a view of one, of one such map. Give me a second here. I'm not sure my screen. One Still going, you know. Okay, we're getting close. Just flipping through the book here.
All right, so I'm going to show my uh, screen now. And this actually uh, is uh, very important, you know, uh, particularly if, you know, people who are, who are uh, very much interested in chemistry, for instance. Uh, phase diagram is uh, very, very important to any kind of understanding any kind of material. And so what we have is, as I've shown here, is a phase diagram for water. And what's interesting is that I can look at this diagram and you see that along the vertical axis is the pressure and the horizontal axis is the temperature. So for instance, you know, I can, if you give me any particular pressure temperature, com, uh, pressure temperature points, I can, tell, I can tell you exactly what the phase of, of the uh, material will be. You know, L means liquid, V means vapor, that means gas, and S is solid. And so, for instance, um, you know, depending upon what the what the uh, temperature and the and the what the temperature pressure temperature is, we can determine what the what the phase is. Literally reading it from a map. All right. And so now we notice we have some solid curves. We have a solid curve between a liquid and the and the gaseous phase. So if we take, for instance, um, you look at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, which is this vertical line, compared with one atmosphere, the pressure is an at atmosphere. Well, that's essentially, that's a, what we call STP in your chemistry class, standard pressure and temperature. So it would be 100 degrees Celsius is your typical boiling point of water. Again, this is the phase diagram for water. One atmosphere with the atmospheric pressure. And we notice that at this point, that, that we go from the liquid phase to, this, to the gaseous phase. Now, the, the, um, at this point, before you reach this, uh, this uh, phase uh, temperature, the entire, the entire substance will be liquid. When you change temperature, for instance, through this phase, for instance, if you increase temperature, the lower temperature to higher temperature, what you have is fractional um, fractional parts of it becoming going from liquid to gas. So it'll be a certain percentage will be li um, you know most of it will be liquid and a smaller percentage will be gas. And eventually, by the time you get through, uh, you know by the time you increase temperature uh, from the below 100 degrees to above 100 degrees, you'll actually um, you'll actually then become 100% gas and 0% liquid. All right, so you see a fractional change. Now you notice that this curve, as you increase the pressure, for instance, that this curve, that the temperature actually increases. So the boiling point, as you increase the temperature, the boiling point actually increases. And it'll actually increase until you reach what is called a, um, what's called the, the, the critical point. The critical point we'll find out is 374 degrees Celsius. Now, 374 degrees Celsius at a, at a pressure of 218 uh, uh, atmospheres. At this point, water can no longer be liquefied. It is only at a gaseous state. That is called the critical temperature and the critical point. That's very important. Now, again, if you lower the, uh, the pressure, let's say you, you start climbing a mountain or something, you'll notice that the temperature, the, the boiling point actually goes down. Now there's a point where, at this point where they, all the three curves meet, that's called a triple point. So it's 0 0.006 um, atmospheres and 273.15 degrees, uh, uh, um, degrees Celsius. There'll be, in this, and only this point on the pressure temperature diagram, all three phases, there'll be parts of the solid, liquid, and gaseous phases at the same time. Now, if you go to lower than 0 0.006 atmospheres and lower than, uh, say, say 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, you'll actually have a point where the uh, temperature, where, where there will be no liquid phase, and literally this line will be between the solid and the, and the vapor phase. You can have, so if you go from liquid to vapor, that's called boiling or that you know and then or evapor evaporation i should say i apologize evaporation be going from liquid to boiling or liquid to vapor going from vapor to liquid be condensation and of course going from uh liquid to solid 
would be freezing, solid liquid would be melting. Now there's a situation where you could go from straight from, and at, these, at this low region, you could go from straight from solid to vapor. That would be called sublimation. And we see examples of this, you know, there's some, it doesn't snow much in Fort Worth, but there's certain situations where it may snow and the next day the snow's gone and like evaporated without going through liquid phase. So that's called sublimation. There are special situations where that can happen. There's also situations where it can go literally from gas to solid. That, that's in development of what we call frost. We see frost occurring. It is as if it went from gas to solid without going through the liquid phase again. So you can have the situation if the conditions are just right. And so again, the, the, um, this um, phase diagram, you can create a phase diagram for any substance, okay? Now, stop sharing here. Now, we have a situation where, you know, we, if we continue to raise the temperature of a substance, you know, we get to the point where we, we have the, uh, what we call the boiling point, right? Now, let's imagine for a moment that you are heating water, but you're covering it with, you're putting a lid on it. So let's just imagine that you heat water, in a pot covered with a lid. Okay, you have, you're heating water in a pot covered with a lid. Now what's happening is what we refer to, we, we, we have a situation where when, when the boiling point is reached, We have, a situ we have a situation where we have equilibrium. Equilibrium will be achieved. A different kind of equilibrium. Where the rate of evaporation i.e. the molecules escaping the liquid going to a gas, will equal the rate of condensation, i.e. the gas molecule sticking to the liquid and becoming liquid. Okay, so when this, so when this occurs, um, we'll actually, the pressure that the gas that the gas will uh, have uh, um, achieved this will be called the vapor pressure. So the pressure um, caused um, basically caused by the vapor at equilibrium. is called the vapor pressure. All right, so in this situation where you have a covered, a covered pot, you have an equilibrium situation where the, um, we, we, the pressure in, of the vapor, the, gap, the, the liquid, the, the vapor inside of the, of the pot will be called the vapor pressure. And that occurs at the boiling point. Now, the amount of, uh, of, um, of atoms, uh, water, you know, water molecules escaping the liquid phase into the gaseous phase, we call that evaporation, that will be exactly equal to the rate of condensation or the gas molecules going back into the liquid, all right? Now, the question comes down to, and of course, 
this, uh, this particular situation is 100 degrees at one atmosphere. So again, um, this equilibrium occurs occurs at T equals 100 degrees Celsius at a pressure of one atmosphere. Now we saw in the phase diagram that if you increase the pressure, that you increase this temperature. If we reduce the pressure, you reduce the temperature. Okay, now what happens though, if I take the, the lid off the pot? When I take the lid off the pot, what, what occurs? Now remember, I'm, I'm talking about equilibrium situation when the lid is on the pot. If we take the lid off of the pot, well, what happens now is that the air or the, the um, um, region in the pot above the liquid, the liquid uh, interface, the liquid vapor interface, if you will, will be part water vapor and part air. with water vapor having escaped. What that now means is that the rate of evaporation actually will be greater than the rate of condensation. So now the rate of evaporation will be greater than a rate of condensation. And boiling will occur. We will no longer have equilibrium. We'll have boiling. So eventually, given that we're, we're constantly having more evaporation than condensation, the water level, the liquid water level in your boiling water, in your, in your water will reduce. Eventually, it'll just go away. You won't have any more liquid water uh, in your pot any longer. In fact, it doesn't even require boiling. It, 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 I mean, if, if you have a glass of water, eventually the glass of water will totally evaporate away. The evaporation rate will be much slower, but every, every so often you'll have a, you'll have a molecule that'll have a, enough uh, energy to escape and you'll have more escaping than condensing. And eventually, even with a glass of water just sitting still long enough, it'll it'll eventually evaporate all away. All right, and so that's just because is you just have more um, you have more uh, evaporation than condensation. Okay, now again, I'll, I'll redefine this, but again, I've talked about vapor pressure. Let's kind of give the official definition of it. So 
vapor pressure again. You hear about a lot of this in your chemistry class. Is to find um, as the pressure uh, at which a gas um, Um, coexists with its um, solid or liquid phase, depending on where it is in the phase diagram. And I gave the example of liquid vapor region with boiling, but again, this hypothetically could also be true at the solid vapor. Um, um, part of the uh, phase diagram as well. Okay. Um, now, the um, the vapor pressure So vapor pressure is uh, created by faster molecules that break away. So they break away um, uh, from the liquid or, or solid and enter the gas into the gas phase. Okay. Now the um, vapor pressure of a substance Uh, it also depends on what that substance is and its temperature. All right, and so now one other um, concept that you may remember from your chemistry class is the concept of partial pressures. All right, and so let's talk about that briefly. All right, so partial pressure. Partial pressure is defined as the pressure <clears throat> it's, it's a pressure um, that a gas would create if it occupied the total volume available. All right, and so we happen to we happen to have um, a um, we call it a law, if you will, but it's not really a law, but we call it Dalton's law of partial pressure. All right, and so essentially, um, you know, that's the partial pressure. Let's uh, let's define. Uh, let's bring up what Dalton's law is. So, in a mixture of gases.
So like air has uh, many different, uh, has different gases in it, like oxygen and nitrogen primarily. And to make sure gas is a total pressure, we call the total pressure uh, is the sum of the partial pressure. Some of the partial pressures of the component gases. Okay, assuming what well, we haven't talked about this yet, ideal gas behavior. Okay, so again, I'm going to kind of reach back to your, we will officially talk about ideal gases uh, in the next uh, chapter. But again, we'll kind of reach back to your ideal gases are gases that are that are that are the perfect gases. They're gases that do not the molecules that, or constituents do not interact with each other. They do not liquefy. Okay, so so assuming ideal gas may you have no liquefaction, it's just a pure gas. That's what Berkeley means in this case. All right, and so uh, this was, ref and, 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 no, and there's no chemical reactions. And no chemical reactions occur. So again, this is a perfect gas, no chemical reactions. We say that the total pressure is sum of all the partial pressures. This is known as Dalton's law of partial pressure. Uh, Dalton's law of partial pressure. Uh, All right, now it's named after John Dalton. This is the work done by John Dalton. who lived in 1766 to 1844. All right, so again, going back to your chemistry class, that's that's probably what, you know, you're, you may, you may uh, recall, but again, yeah, kind of, I'm trying to give you a, an overall feel of everything. Um, now, next topic, and it's kind of a pertinent on a nice July day like we have right now, is relative humidity okay so relative humidity gets down to how water vapor is being held by the air okay so we talk about relative humidity so when we say when we say humidity and i want you to you know when you read weather.com what does it mean well when you say humidity Okay, what you really say, you, you, you really mean relative humidity. Relative humidity is, is, is what we actually mean when we just say humidity. So it's basically relative humidity So the term relative humidity uh, tells us how much water vapor is in the air. Okay, how much water vapor is in the air um, compared with its maximum amount possible? There's a capacity of how much water can be held in the air, how much is in the air compared with its, with its maximum of, uh, possible. So how much water vapors in the air compared with 
the maximum possible. Okay, and so um, at its maximum, which uh, we denote as saturation, uh, the relative humidity is 100%. That would not feel too good. That's where we things feel sticky. And evaporation is inhibited. All right. And so now essentially, you know, there's a a maximum amount of water vapor that air can hold, and that actually depends on the temperature. So again, the relative humidity is basically a simple percentage calculation, and we'll, we'll I'll show you that in a moment. But again, though, the air can hold a certain maximum amount of water. Okay, a certain amount, a maximum amount of water uh, can be held in the air. So let's talk about that for a moment now. So this value changes with temperature. So the amount of water vapor the air can hold okay um, depends on its temperature. So essentially, for example, for example, um, relative humidity rises in the evening. Rises in the evening um, as air temperature declines. So the warmer the air, the greater the amount of amount, the greater water it can hold. So in the evening, you get a certain amount of air, the relative humidity actually actually increases because the temperature goes down at night. Sometimes reaching a dew point. Dew point is basically where you reach saturation and you start seeing liquefaction. You see, you start seeing liquid dropping out of the air. So in the morning, you'll see the plants being wet and you say, why did that happen? It didn't rain that night. Well, essentially it got cold enough where the, the, the or essentially the saturation uh, vapor pressure was, uh, sorry, saturation vapor density was reached and, wa and liquid water started, um, started uh, coming out of, started um, con condensing out of the air. On, you know, you see that on the plants in the morning. We call that the dew point. Dew point. Okay. Um, so again, at the dew at, um, at the dew point temperature, as I just said. Uh, the relative humidity is 100%. You're at max capacity. 
at that point. And you could have, and fog may result. Um, from the condensation of the water droplets. If they form a suspension. Do you wonder why it gets foggy in the morning? Well, that's sometimes the reason. All right, so the amount of water vapor that can, the air can hold depends on this temperature. For example, relative humidity rises in the evening as air temperature declines, sometimes reaching what's called the dew point. The dew point is where the relative humidity reaches 100%, and you could have fog resulting from that. All right. Now, um, the, um, now, for instance, if you wish to dry something like your hair, so why would you use hot air? to dry your hair, for instance. So if you wish to dry something, like your hair, you know, you would use hot air. Um, you blow hot air, over it, over the thing to dry, because hot air has a greater capacity to hold water. So on a, on a day where you apply, you apply the air conditioning, what well, air conditioning feels great because you know the the colder air has a lower capacity to, to hold water. So on a hot day when high humidity, it feels sticky. There's a lot of water in the air. So when you when you go into a nice uh, cooler building that has that's well well air conditioned, it feels it feels great for two reasons. Number one, it's you know you have a you have a lower temperature, but the other reason is the the uh, cooler air has a lower capacity to hold water. So it's drier. You don't have that same ability to hold water as a hotter air does. Okay, so again, um, now, another uh, thing, we've been talking about vapor pressure. So let's kind of put it all together with regards to humidity now. The capacity of air to hold water vapor Okay, um, that depends on the, is based upon the vapor pressure of water. We talked about that a moment ago. Okay, the vapor pressure of water comes into play now. Um, liquid and solid phases are, continuously giving off vapor, vapor all right and um because some of the molecules have high, high enough speeds to enter the gas phase.
Okay, so essentially, as we talked about, you know, the boiling is, um, you know, so, but anyway, we, we talk about liquid vapor in the context of, of boiling, but again, the liquid vapor, liquid, uh, the vapor pressure also has to deal with, um, um, you know, the whole concept of uh, humidity as well. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the basic equation for percent relative humidity. Let's do some calculations. So for instance, um, and it's very, it's very, uh, very basic equation. We want to calculate the percent relative humidity. And again, all you really can do is just look up uh, data from a table. But the uh, percent relative humidity is given by the following formula. Percent relative humidity is equal to the vapor density. divided by the saturation vapor density multiply by 100%. Okay, the saturation vapor density is for given temperature, the maximum amount of vapor that, that, the, uh, that the air can hold. And so whatever the amount of water vapor that's being held by the air right now, divided by the maximum amount that can be held at that particular temperature, multiply that fraction by 100%, you get the percent relative humidity. All right, so I think this could be uh, best uh, summed up. You know, we're gonna, let's, let's do an example here. I'm gonna do example 13.13 .13 from open sex. Now, let me, before I do this, let's, um, let me look at a uh, table first. So let me bring up a table that will help you. So again, when I talk about relative humidity, what I have to do is, is look at the temperature dependence on a table. So let me bring up, uh, in a moment, and bring up a table here. All right, give me a second here. All right, so yeah, let's uh, share this. All right, so this is a uh, OpenStax table 13.5. Saturation, saturation vapor density of water. Okay, so again, we're talking about uh, water in air. And so if you look, the far, the far, far left column is temperature in degrees Celsius of the air. The vapor pressure, you find out what the vapor pressure is, and we'll do a couple problems on that, and the saturation vapor density. Okay, so, you know, if we look at, you know, um, um, right now we're looking at the vapor density, the right-hand column. The saturated vapor density tells you uh, for a given temperature, how much capacity of water vapor can air hold in grams per centimeter, in grams per meter cubed. It tells you that is the maximum capacity for a particular temperature of, of how much the water vapor air can hold. And you look at this table, it's all you can really do. So you look at the table like this, and you figure out what that value is. That's the denominator, that's your vapor, that's your saturation vapor density. Okay, so let me uh, stop sharing this for a moment. Again, you, you see this, um, you see this uh, temperature range all the way from negative 50 degrees Celsius all the way to like, looks like it gets pretty high. So again, this, this, uh, this uh, and here you have 100 degrees Celsius and you know, you find out that you're, you're Vapor pressure, that middle one is the, is the atmospheric pressure, 1.01 that's in the fifth pascals. And your, and again, your, your saturation vapor, den, vapor uh, density would be uh, this number here. So any, anyway, uh, let's uh, do some problems to kind of uh, solidify this answer or this idea. So 
Again, that's the kind of table you're gonna to wanna to look at to do problems like this, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna look at example 13.13 .13 from OpenStax. OpenStax example 13.13. Okay, um, that one says A, uh, calculate the percent relative humidity okay um on a day when the temperature is 25 percent degrees celsius Okay, and the air contains nine point four zero grams of water vapor per meter cube. All right, uh, B, at what temperature will the air reach 100% relative humidity? which is the saturation density. And see, what is the humidity when the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius? So, so C, uh, what is the humidity when the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. And the dew point is negative 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, so OpenStax example 13.13. .13. A, calculate the percent relative, relative humidity on a day when the temperature is 25.0 degrees Celsius and the air contains 9.40 grams of water vapor per meter cube. B, at what temperature will the air reach 100% relative humidity, the saturation density? C, what is the humidity when the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and the dew point is negative 10 degrees Celsius. All right, so we gotta do a little thinking here. <clears throat> so um, let me erase this, do one step at a time. One. <clears throat> so first of all, um, look at A. For A, we're told that, you know, we, you know, again, what's, what's, what is our, our equation? Well, percent relative humidity, is equal to the vapor density divided 
divided by the saturation vapor density. times 100%, all right? So I kind of um, shorten, a few, shorten a few things here to, to write less. So um, I wanna find out, so I'm being told, I'm being told that the, um, the temperature right now is 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. And I'm also told that the air contains 9.40 grams of water vapor per meter cube. So right now it contains, that's the vapor density. That's what it actually contains right now. Is 9.40 grams per meter cube. That is how much water vapor is in the air right now. This is the temperature. Now, I wanna figure out what the saturation vapor density is. I have to look at a table. So I look at the table. So for 25 degrees Celsius, I go at that, at that table, I look up and I find out that the saturation vapor density I look I look up on that table and I can look up and find out that the saturation vapor density is actually going to be 23.0 grams per meter per meter cube. And this is what I just look up. We go to that table you find out that the saturation vapor density that for 25 degrees Celsius, that is the maximum amount of water vapor the air can hold. And this is how much the water, this is how much water vapor the air is holding right now, 9.40. So the question is, okay, well, it's holding 9.40 grams per meter cube right now, and has a capacity at this temperature to hold 23 grams per meter cube. What's the percent relative humidity? I have everything I need to know. So percent relative humidity, is gonna be the vapor density, 9.40 grams per meter cube, divided by the saturation vapor density, which is 23.0 grams per meter cube. Again, those, numbers, those units will cancel each other out. Multiply that fraction by 100%, and my percent relative humidity, what I would, look up or where I would find on weather.com when I run those numbers I would find out that that's 40.9 percent so right now with um 9.40 grams per meter cube and uh, having a maximum capacity of 23 grams per meter cube, the relative humidity at during the day at 25 degrees uh, Celsius will be 40.9%. All right, that's you know 25 degrees Celsius. Now, part B says, oh, at what temperature will the air reach 100% relative humidity? All right, oh, well, right now I'm gonna make the assumption that the air is gonna continue to contain 9.40 grams per meter cubed. For me to get down to 100% relative humidity, I need to lower the, and the temperature is going to lower, be lowered to the point where the saturation vapor density is also 9.40 grams per meter cubed. I'm going to make the assumption that it continues to hold 9.40 grams per meter cubed. All right. And so, So what temperature now I'm going to do B. At what temperature is the saturation vapor density equal to nine point? Four zero grams per meter cubed. Okay, because I'm assuming that the vapor density, which I which I've been given as nine point four zero grams per meter cubed, I'm assuming that's going to stay the same. So during the evening, the temperature is going to go down, and at some point, 
Every single time the temperature goes down, the saturation of vapor density is going to go down. The capacity of the air to hold water is going to reduce. At some point, some temperature, the capacity may get low enough where the saturation of vapor density is equal to the vapor density. We have a relative humidity 100%. Well, if I go and look at the, I go look up at the table, I find out that this occurs. So from the table, from uh, table 13.5, so from OpenStax table 13.5, we find that this occurs. at temperature equal 10 degrees Celsius. So the temperature were to be lower down to 10 degrees Celsius, we would find out that we have 100% relative humidity, that would be the dew point. Okay, literally just because the temperature lowers, the capacity of the air to hold water reduces. And finally, we ask the question, part C, what's the humidity when the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and the dew point is negative 10 degrees Celsius? Okay, so this is a different problem. This one doesn't rely on the other two. So, so part C, we're told, we're told right now that right now, this is part C, the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius right now. The dew point, we're also told that the dew point is um, negative 10 degrees Celsius. We want to find what is the relative humidity. Well, they just gave me an important piece of information. They told me what the dew point was. So the dew point basically means, oh, the negative 10 degrees Celsius. That's, so the dew point is essentially the, the point where the saturation um, or the saturation, if, if the relative, if the vapor density is equal to the saturation of vapor density, then you're going to, then, then you'll have 100% relative humidity. Well, that means that the saturation vapor density that means that the vapor density is that saturation vapor density at 10, negative 10 degrees Celsius. So I look up, so, so if we look up, the saturation vapor density for negative 10 degrees Celsius in open stacks table 13.5, we find it to be, what do we find it to be? 2.36 grams per centimeter cubed. Grass meter cube. Well, what that's telling me is that's how much what my what my vapor density is right now. So this means, I mean, if I were to allow the temperature to fall, you know, uh, to negative ten degrees Celsius, then the vapor density that it's in there right now would be the dew point. So, so basically, basically this means that the vapor density that I, for right now. is 2.36 grams per meter cube. So that means that I have 2.36 grams per meter cube in the air. And if we were allowed, right now the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, we're allowed that the temperature were to fall to negative 10 degrees Celsius, then that amount of water vapor in the air would be the dew point. That it would, it would um, give a um, 
saturate, it would give a relative humidity, percent relative humidity of 100%. So what that information just told me is what is the vapor density in the air right now? Okay, so now it's 25 degrees Celsius. We know the capacity of the air is higher. All right, and so at 25 degrees Celsius, the saturation vapor density is, we can look this up, we find out at 25 degrees Celsius, it is actually 23.0 grams per meter cubed. According to Open Stacks Table thirteen point five. All right. So again, telling us that the dew point is negative ten degrees Celsius tells us that at negative ten degrees Celsius, whatever the saturation, whatever the vapor density that's in the air right now would indeed be the dew point. What that just tells us is that that is. The vapor density right now and at 20 and, and at that's 2.36 grams per meter cube looking up at the table at 25 degrees celsius the actual capacity of air to hold water is 23 degrees celsius or sorry sorry 23 grams per meter cube so what is the percent relative emitter well i know what how much vapor density is in the air right now i know what the capacity is so now it's just a matter of computing the percent relative humidity so percent relative humidity is the vapor density, 2.36 grams per meter cubed, divided by the saturation of vapor density at, 20, at 25 degrees Celsius. That's 23.0 grams per meter cubed times 100%. And if I do that calculation, I find out that the percent relative humidity right now from the clues that I was that was dropped to me, the percent relative humidity is 10.3%. Um, so it should feel like a pretty dry day. All right, so from the clues that were given to me for part C. Okay. Um, I'm going to do open sacks 13.49. No problem. Uh, that problem says dry air. is 78.1% nitrogen. What is the partial pressure of nitrogen? When the atmospheric pressure is at most spirit. One point zero one times ten to the fifth Pascals. So dry air is seventy eight point one percent nitrogen. What is the partial pressure of nitrogen? when the atmospheric pressure is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Well, the partial pressure of nitrogen is simply going to be 78.1%, 0.781 times that total pressure, 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. So we will find out that the partial pressure of nitrogen would simply be 
7.89 uh, times 10 to the fourth Pascal. There it is. Okay. Um, let's do uh, open sacks 13.50. All right, so that says uh, A, what is the vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius? Okay, uh, B. <clears throat> what percentage of atmospheric pressure uh, does this correspond to? Okay, and C, what percent of 20 degree Celsius air um, is water vapor Uh, if it has 100% relative humidity. All right, the density of dry air Uh, at 20 degrees Celsius is 1.20 kilograms per meters cubed. All right, so <clears throat> A, so open sacks 13.50. A, what is the vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius? B, what percentage of atmospheric pressure does this correspond to? C, what percent of 20 degree Celsius air in, is water vapor if it has 100% relative humidity? The density of dry air at 20 degrees Celsius is 1.20 kilograms per meters cubed. All right. So, um, well, let's see here. Let's um, erase this and work the problems. <clears throat> so, I'll start off with A. A says, again, um, what is the vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius? Well, got to go back to table 13.5. So quite simply, according to open stacks table 13.5. Okay, look at, look at, at that table. Um, the vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius um, <clears throat> is 2.33 times 10 to the third Pascals. Simply a table lookup. You look at OpenSax 30.5, say, ah, oh, 20 degrees Celsius, there is 
the, the, there's the vapor pressure of uh, water. So it's nothing more than a lookup. Okay, so you're gonna a lot of table lookups in this case. All right, so now you know that. Part B says, well, what percentage of atmospheric pressure does this correspond to? Now we have this pressure, and okay, that's part A. Well, what percentage of atmospheric pressure does this correspond to? Well, part B, that would be percent water, percent pressure of water, okay, is simply gonna be what? 2.33 times 10 to the third pascals, that pressure that we just computed, the vapor pressure that we looked up, divided by the atmospheric pressure of water, and that's 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals, you know, one atmosphere basically. That percentage multiplied by 100%. You find out that the percent of the of the pressure due to the water vapor working that out you find out that to uh, for that to simply be um 2.30 percent okay now um part c says what percentage of 20 degree air is water vapor if it has 100% relative humidity. All right, so, okay, so let's look at uh, part C. We have a big clue here, all right? The big clue is um, saturation vapor density. So again, we're reading this carefully here. Uh, what percent of 20 degrees Celsius air is water vapor if it has 100% relative humidity? Okay, that's the big clue. Is that if we have to look up, so the saturation vapor density, look this up. Okay, um, of water at 20 degrees Celsius, is, look it up, 17.2 grams per meter cubed. Which is equal to 17.2 times 10 to the negative three kilograms per meter cubed. And again, that's from that table, uh, from OpenStax table 13.5 again. Um, if percent relative humidity is 100%, then the vapor density is equal to the saturation vapor density. That vapor density is equal to 17.2 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms per meter cubed. That's the big clue, is that we are looking at 100% relative humidity at 20 degrees Celsius. So now we know what the vapor density is from that clue. All right, and so what are we being asked? We're being asked um, um, what percent of, what, so what percent of 20 degrees Celsius uh, air is water vapor if it has 100% relative humidity, all right? So, so essentially what, we, what you now do is you say, well, percent of water vapor, we now know how much water vapor is in the air. So percent, that's water vapor. Now we know how much is in the air. Well, that's gonna be the vapor density over the density of dry air times 100%. And okay, we just got that divided by the density of dry air. That's multiplied by 100%. All right, so what I would then do is percent of water vapor 
is the vapor density, 17.2 times 10 to the negative three kilograms per meter cubed divided by 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed times 100%, that's equal to 1.43%. Okay, so I was given the clue that now at 20 degrees Celsius, the air was at 100% relative humidity. That tells me that vapor density is equal to the saturation vapor density. I can look up the saturation vapor density from the table, uh, open that table 13.5 and I automatically get the vapor density. And I know the density of dry air, I was given that in parentheses of parenthetical statement of 1.2 kilograms per meters cubed. So I just take the fraction of how much, or what the vapor density, um, a, a water vapor or a vapor density is divided by the density of dry air, multiplied by 100%, and I get a small percentage of 1.43%. Okay. And um, okay. Do another problem. Open stacks 13.52. Uh, that says, at what temperature does water boil? So part A, at what temperature does water boil? <clears throat> at an altitude of 1500 meters. Which is about um, 5000 feet. on a day when the atmospheric pressure is 8.59 times 10 to the fourth Pascals. And then part B, uh, what about, uh, what about an altitude of um, 3000 meters? And that's about uh, about ten thousand feet. When atmospheric pressure is uh, 7.00 times 10 to the fourth Pascals. All right, so open stacks 30 by 52. What temperature does water boil at an altitude of 1,500 meters, about 5,000 5, feet, on a day when <clears throat> the atmospheric pressure is 8.59 times 10 to the fourth Pascals. And then B, what about an altitude of 3,000 meters, about 10,000 feet, 
when the atmospheric pressure is 7.00, then send the fourth Pascal. All right, so keep that information in. And this ends up being simply a couple of lookups. All right, for part A, um, essentially, uh, Um, we know that the uh, the boiling that boiling occurs all right at a temperature where uh, the atmospheric pressure corresponds to the vapor pressure. Okay, we know that. So essentially for the first problem, you know, we look at the table a vapor pressure. So essentially, you know, looking at a uh, table 13.5 again, according to uh, OpenStax table 13.5, right, a vapor pressure I'm looking at that uh, middle column, a vapor pressure of 8.59 times 10 to the fourth Pascals. Uh, corresponds to a boiling temperature. Um, of 95 degrees. Celsius. So essentially, you know, at, at the, um, at, at sea level, your vapor pressure or the, or the, you know, corresponds to a temperature of, of, uh, 100 degrees Celsius. That would be boiling at sea level. If you're at 5,000 feet up, the vapor pressure is lower boiling occurs at 95 degrees Celsius now. And, and that's part A. If you were to go to part B, now you're gonna go to, you know, now you go, you look at a, a, at a different vapor pressure, you know, you're now at 10,000 feet. So now we're looking at 7.00 times 10 to the fourth Pascals, part B. And that corresponds to a, 90 degrees Celsius. All right, so going even higher, your vapor pressure reduces and the table says that corresponds to 90 degrees Celsius. So now you're at 10,000 feet, you boil water, not at 100 degrees Celsius, but you boil water at 90 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, let me do one more uh, relative humidity problem. Open stacks 13.60. All right, so that says if the relative humidity uh, is 90.0%. on a muggy summer morning. <clears throat> 
when the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, the temperature is 20.0 degrees Celsius. What will it what will it be later in the day? What will it be later in the day um, when the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius? Assuming water vapor density remains constant. All right, so if the relative humidity is 90.0%, on a muggy summer morning when the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. What will it be later in the day when the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, um, assuming water vapor density remains constant? All right, and so, <clears throat> all right, so let's, we're gonna have to go and again, look at these uh, various uh, tables. So keep in mind what these numbers are. I have to raise the board for real estate purposes. <clears throat> Okay, um, well, according to table, uh, OpenStax table 13.5, um, the saturation vapor density of water is looking at that table, it is going to be 17.2 grams per meter cube. Now we're told that at that point it's 90% relative humidity. All right. And so going back to that formula, remember that percent relative humidity is the vapor density. divided by the saturation vapor density times 100%. Well, I know the relative humidity point is 0.9 is 0 0.90 or or 90%. The vapor density I don't know that, but I do know the saturation vapor density at that temperature, 17.2. So I can actually solve for this, this problem. So essentially I can say, well, this is 90%. All right, and then I can divide, uh, I can essentially effectively um, cross multiply and I can get that the saturation, I can get that the vapor depth, the, um, vapor density at this point I mean 90 over 100 is 0 0.9 0 0.9 to saturation vapor density I mean 0 0.90 times the saturation vapor density 17.2 grams per meter cube so I find out that the vapor density Okay, of the water in the air, I got to find that out first, is 15.5 grams per meter cube. Okay, that is what the 
vapor density is. Now we're gonna make the assumption that's gonna stay the same and the temperature is going to increase. Well, what do we know? Well, as the temperature increases, the capacity to hold water increases. So I expect the relative humidity to go down, all right? So that is my vapor density, which is gonna stay constant. So now I go back to my table and I realize that this vapor density is now gonna remain constant. And then I go to 30 degrees. Now, at 30 degrees, according to, again, according to to open stacks table 13.5 at 30 degrees Celsius, the saturation vapor density comes, going back to the table, looking that up, it becomes 30.4 grams per meter cube. So if I imagine the vapor density staying the same, the percent relative humidity is again the vapor density, 15.5 grams per meter cube, which I'm saying stays the same, divided by the new saturation vapor density for the higher temperature, 30 degrees, 30.4 grams per meter cubed, multiplied by 100%. And I find out that the percent relative humidity becomes 50.9%. So it's bad, but not as bad as 90%. Gotta wait for the temperature to rise. Okay, that's it for relative humidity. Now, what we talked about now is we talked about temperature, we talked about phase changes, talked about humidity, you know, all of these, are changes because of temperature change. You know, we have we have changes of you know expansion and contraction, thermal expansion, thermal contraction. We have phase changes, and we have you know a change in the capacity of of you know um, uh, water to hold to hold. I'm sorry, of, of air to hold water. That's all about temperature. Now, the, now the question really comes down to in thermal dynamics, we have to really answer the question. Well. First of all, you know, we have to we have to say, well, we have we have to have that uh, temperature change. But the question we have to ask is, well, why does temperature change? We understand temperature now. Now that we start asking the why question, why does temperature change? The answer to that question is heat transfer. And then, of course, the next question would be, okay, well, why heat transfer? And the question there becomes the laws of thermodynamics. So that's kind of where we're going. We're at a point right now where we have to answer the question, well, we have, uh, we have temperature change, but now, and we, we definitely understand that. Now the question is, well, why, why does that occur? Why would temperature change occur? Well, now we go into this, uh, what's called heat transfer. So the question is, you know, heat is yet another um, scientific term that people use all the time, but I would say that most people don't really understand what it means, right? So let's, under, let's first of all, understand what does heat mean? All right, so heat by its definition, heat is the spontaneous it's a spontaneous uh, transfer of energy to 
do do a temperature change. All right. Now, important here is, is the word spontaneous. There's a little bit of a lack of control uh, involved with heat. You don't really, you know, it's, it's there's unpredictability, but because it, there is, it is spontaneous. But if you have temperature change, you have this energy transfer called heat. The units of heat, the units of heat like any energy, any other energy is joules. Every energy has a unit of joules. Heat is no different. So, you know, again, heat is an energy. Units of heat are joules. Okay, now uh, we happen to have, you know, the joules, that's the SI unit of heat. So the joule is the SI unit of heat. And again, it's an energy, no surprise. Now we typically will have um, other, other units that you may see um, um, in, in, um, in effect for heat. So you may see heat described in terms of the calorie. All right, so the calorie is another way of describing heat. The calorie is um, defined Defined um, as, as, as the energy needed um, let's see, energy to change the temperature of 1.00 gram of water by uh, one degree Celsius, 1.00 degrees Celsius, and specifically between 14.5 degrees and 15.5 14.5 degrees Celsius and 15.5 degrees Celsius, right? So, so that's um, since there's a slight temperature dependence, we have to be particularly specific about about what. But that is that is the uh, that is the uh, what how you define the calorie. Now, typically, we talk about calories. We, you know, we we generally tend to talk about larger larger masses so we typically talk about kilograms so we end up having what's called the kilocalorie now what we call the capital c calorie is actually the kilocalorie so a kilocalorie okay a kilocalorie is the energy needed to change um, 1.00, the temperature, sorry, to change the temperature of 1.00 kilograms of water by 1.00 degrees Celsius. Okay, and, and again, um, typically what we call the food calorie, a food calorie would 
which we refer to as a capital C calorie, is a is really a kilocalorie. Oops, kilocalorie. So the food calorie is typically the kilocalorie. So what we see is what we normally call calories in the vernacular is really the kilocalorie. Now the question is, how does heat generally relate to a temperature change? So the uh, heat, uh, as as we said, is uh, is uh, the spontaneous uh, transfer of energy due to a temperature change. So we know that the heat transfer uh, is related to temperature change. And so there, so generally speaking, there's a couple of different uh, ways we're going to consider heat transfer. So first of all, um, heat transfer occurs. So if Heat transfer occurs um, without a phase change. So it's in phase, then it does so. in accordance with the following empirical formula. And that is Q is the heat transfer is equal to the mass of the substance times what is called the specific heat capacity times delta T. Okay, so M is the mass of the substance. Typically, in kilograms and C is called the specific heat. So it's actually little c is the specific heat and uh, that depends on the material and the phase. So it's a constant that you need, it's an empirical constant that you have to look up. Okay, so MC delta T. So let me, uh, let me go to a table. To uh, show you, um, some examples of, of specific heats. So give me uh, a second here. So it's an empirical formula. There's nothing to derive. Give me a second here. I'm gonna go to a table. <clears throat> I'm flipping through the book right now, the OpenStax book. All right, let's go. All right, here we are.
All right, so I'm looking at, hang on, almost there. Okay, there we are. Table 14.1 of OpenStax. So let me share this. All right, so notice that, okay, so we have a specific heat capacity, or actually a specific heat. It's in uh, uh, joules per kilogram degree Celsius or kilocalories per kilogram degree Celsius, one of the two. Now, the, um, you see various solids, first of all, and all the solids have their own specific heat. Basically, the, it is the, is a, a measure of essentially the heat transfer capability in the material. So, um, so material's ability to uh, to uh, absorb heat is really a um, is really measured, or this is kind of a measure of that. And so we have, um, uh, for instance, you know these various solids. Now, notice something interesting here is if I go down, I have ice. And then, so that's solid water. And then among, then I have some liquids. And notice I have, now, now the uh, open stacks refers to water as, um, I mean, liquid water is just water. No, water really has three phases. All of it is water, but open stacks, water means liquid water. Okay, so this is liquid water, different heat, uh, a different specific heat. And then you go to steam and yet a different specific heat. So not only does it depend on the substance, as I stated, it also depends on the phase. Specific heats have depend on the substance and the phase. So again, these are numbers that you have to look up in a table. So your book has a table as well. All right. So that is the, that is the specific heat. All right. So again, this is uh, dealing with, um, a substance that remains in phase. It does not make a phase transition. During its, uh, while it remains in the same phase, it's uh, heat as a function of temperature. It's also a function of mass. And the, the specific heat is a constant that you need to look up. And that's really, that's all there really is to it. You go to OpenStax uh, table 14.1, or you go to the specific heat, um, uh, table that your book provides, and essentially that governs how the uh, heat uh, is, a, is, a, is a function of temperature, temperature, temperature change. So again, heat is energy that is transferred due to a temperature change. All right, uh, I'm going to work some problems. So again, it's empirical, so there's nothing to derive. OpenStax 14.1. OK, uh, on a hot day, like today, on a hot day, the temperature of an 80,000 liter swimming pool Increases by 1.50 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, what is the net heat transfer? during this heating. All right, um, ignore any complications.
um, such as loss of water due to evaporation. All right. So, problem 14.1 of open stacks. On a hot day, the temperature of an 80,000 liter swimming pool increases by 1.50 degrees Celsius. What is the net heat transfer during this heating? Ignore any complications such as loss of water due to evaporation. Okay. All right, 80,000 liter swimming pool, 1.50 degrees. All right, so let's uh, erase this and get going. Okay, um, so the delta T will be 1.50 degrees Celsius, all right? The volume, so again, what are we looking for? Well, again, the Q is MC delta T. We have delta T. We need to find M and we know the volume of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the water, so we can use mass as, as, as density times volume in order, in order to get the mass. So we have to figure out the volume. We need to get the volume in, a, uh, in SI units. Right now it's in liters. So right now the volume is 80,000 liters. All right. And so we know that a liter is equivalent to a decimeter cubed. And that gets rid of liters. And of course, um, there are 0 0.1 meters in a decimeter. And you got to cube that. Okay, and you work that out, you find out that the that the volume is going to be 80 meters cubed. There's your volume. And now the density of water. I know that's a thousand kilograms per meter cube. Just gonna assume fresh water. Okay, and so the mass is the density of water times the volume. That's gonna be 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. multiplied by 80 meters cubed. So the mass is going to be a whopping 80,000 kilograms. All right, that's a lot of mass. So now I know the mass. I can look up the specific heat of water. So we can look that up in that table, table uh, for open X 14.1, look it up, or your table, we find out that the, that the specific heat of water is 4186 um, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Now, remember that's liquid water. We have three types of water really in, the, in that table, solid, liquid, gas, ice, is what they call the solid, steam is what they call the gas. All of it's really water, as you know, but we'll just say this is liquid water. All right, so we have everything we need. We have M, we have C, and we have delta T. So the heat will be 80,000 kilograms, all right, times 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius times uh, 1.50 degrees Celsius. So the heat transfer will be 5.02 times 10 to the eighth joules, a huge amount of heat, just to raise the temperature of the pool one and a half degrees Celsius. All right, that's 14.1, open stacks. No phase changes here.
Water remains liquid. Okay. Um, the open stacks, um, 14.8. All right, uh, there I have the number of kilocalories in food. is determined by calorimetry, which we would have done if we were met face to face in one thermal lab in this class. So if you had chemistry, you've, you've had calorimetry as well. Uh, calorimetry techniques, I'm sorry, yes. in which the food is burned. And the amount of heat transfer is measured. Okay, uh, how many kilocalories per gram? Are there any 500 gram, I'm oh, sorry, are there in a 5.00 gram peanut? If the energy from burning it is transferred to zero point five zero kilograms of water. held in a 0 0.100 kilogram aluminum cup. causing a 54.9 degree temp Celsius temperature increase. All right, what space do I have left? Uh, B, says compare uh, your answer to labeling information. Oh, let's see. Label the information found on a package of peanuts.
and comment on whether the values are consistent. Let's see if I have enough room here. Yeah, okay. So anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. So the long, long, long problem. So the number of kilocalories in food is determined by calorimetry techniques in which the food is burned. And the amount of heat transfer is measured. How many kilocalories per gram are there in a 5.00 gram peanut? If the energy from burning it is transferred to 0.500 kilograms of water held in a 0.100 kilogram aluminum cup, causing a 54.9 degree temperature increase. And then B, compare your answer to labeling information found on a package of peanuts. Okay. All right, a lot of words there. So what's going on? All right, so calorimetry, when you see the information on how many calories food takes, well, what they actually did is they took food and they burned it. And then that, that, and that uh, heat went into water in an aluminum cup and, and basically a calorimeter, and you determine how much energy was captured by the water. So the energy that left the burned food goes into the water, and you measure that, and you figure out how much energy that is. That's, that's how you figure out what the caloric intake is, right? So what do we do here? Well. Remember, so so remember that the that there's always going to be the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So that means that you have water in an aluminum cup. The water and the aluminum cup must both increase in temperature together. They must always have the same temperatures. They are in thermal contact. All right. And so the calorimetry experiment, if you look at it, you have aluminum cup. And inside of it is water. Okay, so this is the aluminum cup. And inside is water. Okay, the heat, the heat Q must raise the temperature. of the water and the aluminum cup together. And that is due to thermal equilibrium imposed by the zeroth law of thermodynamics. All right, so they raise together. Some people don't understand that initially. Okay, we talked about the zeroth law of thermodynamics. They're in thermal contact, they must and they must be in thermal equilibrium all times. The water is touching the aluminum, the aluminum cup, okay? So they rise together. So how does my, my heat transfer equation look then? Well, I have to raise the temperature together. So my Q is going to be brackets. So the mass of the water times the specific heat of water plus the mass of the cup times the specific heat of aluminum, okay, MC, they, and they both raise in temperature the same amount. I mean, really, it should be M water, C water, delta T plus M cup C, aluminum delta T, but I pulled the delta T out. They, write, they rise in temperature together. Yeah, the contribution from the water and the contribution from the cup. So the heat that goes in from the burning of the peanut must be, must be distributed to the water and the cup. And the temperature of the two rise together. Okay, very important to understand that. So here we go. Q is the mass of the water, 0 0.500 kilograms. Okay, the specific heat of liquid water. Again, you look this up in a table like table OPUS X 
it's 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius plus the mass of the cup. The cup is 0 0.100 kilogram. And specific heat of aluminum, you look this up. Oh, you know what? I did this in kilocalories. There's the other one. So hang on, this is in calories. I apologize. So again, this is also in the table. If you look up in the table for water, it is the uh, specific heat in kilocalories per degree, per kil kilograms of pound degree Kelvin, I'm sorry, per degree Celsius is 1.000. Kilocalories per kilograms degrees Celsius. Sorry about that. I worked this out here. Kilocalories. That's all food calories are. All right. And then uh, for aluminum, you look that up, you get 0 0.215 kilocalories per kilograms degrees Celsius. All of these increase together by we found empirically to be 54.9 degrees Celsius. So you notice that the kilograms cancel out the kilograms in the specific heat and the degree Celsius cancel out the degree Celsius from the, from the temperature. And so you end up having kilocalories equals kilocalories. You should have, you should have energy on the right-hand side. All right, so when you work this uh, calculation out, you find out that it's 28.63. kilocalories but we want the kilocalories per mass right we really want q over m this is about this what, what caused this this was caused by a five gram peanut right so i take 28.63 kilocalories and that was and that was uh, generated by a five gram peanuts so 5.00 grams. And we find out that that's going to be 5.73 kilocalories per gram. Okay. The kilogram, 5.73 kilocalories per gram. So let's kind of parking lot this for a moment. This is my part A. So Q over M, heat per mass is 5.73 kilocalories per gram. Okay, got that from the theoretical calculation or the calculation from the, uh, uh, from the uh, heat transfer equation. Now, we want to compare this with uh, labeling, package labeling. So I went to the store once and a couple of years ago, I went to the store and I looked at a, I looked at a uh, I looked at a label on unsalted uh, roasted dry roasted peanut. So, so again, looked. So I looked at a label a label on some salted dry roasted peanuts. All right, and. I saw on a label that um, basically 33 grams, there are 33 grams of peanuts, and essentially that they um, uh, contain, according to the labeling, 200 kilocalories. So, okay, let's take a look at that. Q over M would be what? 200 kilocalories per 33 grams. See how close I get. When I do that calculation, I get 6.1 kilocalories per gram. Well, that's, you know, within, within decent error, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good agreement. So yes, that's, that's, that is a reasonable calculation. What you see in a label compared with what we calculated just now, those two numbers agree pretty closely. Now, the thing about it is, okay, so that's, that is what I just got in computing here, or what we've got done working out, is heat being transferred 
when the phase does not change. What happens if the phase changes? So we, we may have a situation where the where you may have a phase change. Like uh, the solid or liquid or liquid or gas. All right. And so so essentially what ends up happening, and I'll kind of look at it in a, an experiment here. So if I take a look at an experiment, I mean I did this first time in high school. Um, Let's see here if I have a, a good little picture. Let me see, I'll show a little picture here. I don't know, one second. I think there's a good graph to look at as opposed to looking at my drawing. I had this experiment for the first time back in high school. I found it to be uh, pretty fascinating. All right, here's the graph that I want to look at. So let me share this graph with you. And um, okay, so all right, so what you see is a graph of temperature versus delta Q over M. So essentially, um, if, you, if you imagine, you know, if, if, if Q equals MC delta T, what I, what I really have here is, I mean, the, the graph is, is T versus delta Q over M. So, so what I have, um, if I do this right here, see delta Q, let's write this on a white border, delta Q is MC delta T, so, um, delta Q over M is C delta T. So if I'm looking at delta T, it's going to be one over C times delta Q over M. All right. So, so essentially what I'm going to see here is that the slope. So what, what you're going to see is three phases or three regions. So down in the uh, lower part, uh, lower part of this curve, you see that you start this experiment at negative 20. You, you start the experiment with pure ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius. Now there's going to be a linear relationship depending uh, that, that depends on M C delta T. Now you know it's it's T versus delta Q over M. So the slope of this graph is one divided by the specific heat. Okay, so you see that ice. Is you're going to have a you're going to have a, a a linear equation of a certain slope, and the and essentially as the as the as you keep putting heat into the system, the temperature is going to increase linearly. And then you get to a point where you you reach your first phase boundary. Now, when the first phase boundary is achieved, you no longer as as heat goes into the system, you no longer change in temperature. What happens now is that is that the solid is a very tight lattice, a very solid, a tight lattice structure. All the heat goes into breaking up this lattice structure and essentially change, it's like a cocoon, changing the phase of this lattice structure, breaking it down into a liquid. So all, it's all hands on deck. Essentially all the heat goes, that goes into this system entirely is spent breaking down the lattice structure. Once all the ice is gone, and only when all the ice is gone and becomes liquid water, do you uh, now have uh, heat that goes into increase the temperature? So during the during the time when you have the phase transition, temperature does not change. All you know, all the heat goes into breaking down the lattice structure till all the ice is gone. Once all the ice is gone, then you have then you go on to the second line. And essentially now you're in a liquid phase. And as, as heat goes into the system, the temperature increases. And that happens at a different slope because the heat, specific heat of liquid water is different than the specific heat of, of, of solid water or ice until you get to the next phase, uh, phase uh, boundary. And that's at 100 degrees Celsius. 
Now you look and you see you have this very, very large amount of heat that, that, um, that, that now uh, goes into breaking up the, the liquid molecules into a gaseous stage. This is an extremely expensive process. So basically, changing phase is extremely expensive, heat-wise. So by the time, so all of this heat goes into changing the, the phase of all the water present until it all becomes steam. And then you go on to the next, the next line as you increase the temperature. And essentially what, what happens then is that, is that you have a different slope because the specific heat of steam is different than so the heat of liquid water, which is different than the specific heat of, of solid water. So again, you have the MC, so to recap, you have the MC delta T uh, formulation, uh, both in when it's in phase, whether it's whether the whether your uh, all the heat transfer was in the solid phase, the liquid phase, or the gaseous phase. And so you, you notice that as you put heat into the system, the temperature increases when you're one of those phases. And again, it's at a, it's at a linear relationship, and it's and it's and it's determined by the specific heat. When you reach a phase boundary, all of the heat there's no more temperature change in the phase boundary. All the heat goes into breaking up the phase, breaking up the solid in the in the lo, in the lower line, breaking up all the the solid uh, lattice, putting it into the liquid form, basically putting it in a, into a cocoon, and out comes something completely different, liquid water. Then with liquid water, you have uh, again you're in, a, in phase and you will uh, as t t heat goes into the system, the temperature rises in a linear fashion again be, via MC delta T with a different C, the the C for liquid water until you reach the next phase boundary. And there, no more temperature increase. All the heat goes into the system to break up the liquid water into pure steam. And you do not start increasing temperature again until all the liquid water has been converted to the pure steam. Okay, it's a very, very important diagram how this works. Now, as you can see in these plateaus, there is a very large amount of heat required to change phase. All right, and so the MC delta T relationship that I, that, um, that I showed you is, um, is true for, for essentially uh, physics, uh, or basically, uh, uh, heat, um, or basically heat transfer within phase, where you do not involve a change in phase. Now, as I showed you, uh, essentially, I wrote the delta, you know, just kind of give an idea of what we're looking at in that, um, on that diagram, you know, what was the slope? Well, again, I, I saw the delta Q is MC delta T. Now, I saw it was delta T over Q, over, delta Q over M. So, delta Q over M is C delta T, and of course, we want to flip it around. The, the delta T was the vertical axis. The delta Q over M was the horizontal axis. And so the slope of any of those lines was 1 over C. Okay, so you're basically seeing different slopes because in, 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 those, in those particular lines. So what happens, though, when, you're, when you have heat transfer in those, in those regions where you, had, where you saw the phase change? All right, so we're going to look at the phase change regions. All right, so again, as I said, they're, they're, very, they're very expensive. So, so again, to, to recap, um, so when you saw the, the, the solid liquid, you know, phase, you know, you know that energy is required. Energy is required to melt a solid. So it's required to melt a solid uh, because of the, the cohesive bonds between the molecule. And the solid must be broken apart. I look at it as like a cocoon, a butterfly, 
a, 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 a caterpillar enters and a butterfly leaves. You know, essentially you see something that comes out, even though it's really made out of the same material, it comes out looking totally different. Solid ice and liquid water look totally different from each other. Okay, yet they're the same water mold. Okay. And so, and so, so it's broken apart um, such that uh, in the liquid, the molecules can move around at all comparable kinetic energies. Let's say it can just move around. So essentially, you have a you have something that is still tied together. You have the molecules that are definitely attracted to one another in terms of a liquid, but they're not rigidly fixed. So it's a it's a totally different kind of a kind of a substance. All right. Now at the same time, energy uh, is needed to vaporize. A liquid uh, because molecules and liquid interact with each other via attractive forces. In a gas, they are free. All right, so, so essentially there's some very simple relationships that deal with heat transfer in phase in, in, in phase. Again, while the heat, while heat is being is being received by the system while it is in phase, temperature change does not occur. All the heat goes into the phase change. Okay. So it's all hands on deck, all the heat goes into the phase change. You know, while the while the phase is changing, um, there is no there is no uh, temperature increase. So the energy required energy required um, uh, to melt or freeze, depending on which direction you're going. A substance um, of mass M is Q is uh, M L sub F. Okay, and this and L sub F is a, L sub F is the latent heat of fusion. Again, a value you need to look up in a table. Okay. The energy, likewise, the energy required um, to vaporize or condense. Depending on which direction you're going. A substance of mass M is very similar looking formula. Q is M times L sub V. L sub V is the latent heat of vaporization. Again, another another num uh, value you look up in a table. Okay, very important information. Now, 
let's take a look at these values real quick. All right, and so again, I'll, I'll go back to open stats. Let's look at these L sub Fs and L sub E values. I'll share my screen here. Okay, so I'm gonna come up, pop up a little bit. Now, these are the heats of fusion and vaporization. Now, of course, you know, they, there's only one such value or one set of values for each substance because unlike before, you know, there is no phase that they're attached to, they're going between phases. So Fusion means it's going between the solid and liquid phase, and vaporization means it's going between the liquid and gaseous phase. So, so you look at water, for instance. All right. So, so here's the heat of fusion. So, you know, it, it gives you the melting point. Melting point for water, we know, is, is 0, 0.00. Now, let's look at this number 334. Okay. What is that? Kilojoules per, cal per kilogram. That's 334 kilojoules. That's 334,000 joules. That is a huge number. It is extremely expensive, heat-wise, to melt to melt something. It is a it is a huge um, expense in heat to do so. Now, if you read over a little further, you look at the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. Look at this number. 2256 kilojoules per kilogram is 2256 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram. That is a, an enormous number. You saw how, lo how large that plateau was on that graph. Now, if you go on that graph, you know, a little further down, you see this plateau for the, for, you, know, you know, to go from, uh, to go from what, to go from liquid water to steam. That is a lot of heat. That is an extremely expensive process in order to be able to um, vaporize uh, water from a, from a liquid to a gas. Very, very large, uh, very, very large amount of uh, energy required to do so. So keep that in mind. There, it, is a, it is extremely expensive to do this. These are, these are very large numbers, okay? So coming back to the um, whiteboard, so again, these are numbers you're going to have to look up in order to do this, but just keep in mind that these are about, these are large values. Let me give you an example how large this value is, all right? So I always kind of like to like give this example. So imagine for a moment, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to figure out how much energy is required to melt one kilogram of ice. Then I want to figure out how much, te what temperature change and equivalent liquid water at zero degrees Celsius, what the, what the temperature change is um, if I just start if I just put that same amount of heat into liquid water. Okay, so let's do a let's do a comparison. Okay, I'm going to figure out the heat required to um, melt basically one kilogram of ice. All right, so what is the heat? What heat Q is required? to melt 1.0 kilograms of ice at zero degrees Celsius. All right, so simple enough calculation. Q is ML sub F, mass times the heat of, heat of fusion, right? So I have one kilogram, I look up in the table, and again, what was it? It was 334 kilojoules per kilogram. So 334 times 10 to the third, okay, kilojoule, joules per kilogram. And I find out that the heat required to do this is 334 times 10 to the three joules. Or, so 334 times 10 to the third joules. Okay, to melt just one kilogram of ice. So when I put that amount of heat in there, I start off with ice, one kilogram of ice at zero degrees Celsius, and I end up with one kilogram of 
liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. Now, what happens if I took that same amount of heat and put it into one kilogram of water, liquid water at zero degrees Celsius? So what temperature increase? would occur if the same heat, the same amount of heat was put into 1.0 kilograms of liquid water. at zero degrees Celsius, all right? So let's figure that out. How would I figure that out? Well, I would go with Q equals MC delta T, and I'll solve for delta T. Delta T is just Q over MC. Q, just big number, 334 times 10 to the third joules divided by 1.0 kilograms. I look up the, uh, the specific heat of liquid water, it's 4186. Joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. And it turns out that that value ends up being 79.8 degrees Celsius. So if I take the same amount of heat that I, that, that I need to just melt one kilogram of ice, and I put that amount of heat into one kilogram of liquid water at the same zero degrees Celsius temperature, that water will end up at 79.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's 100 degrees Celsius is boiling. You'll get, you'll get relatively close. You'll be, you'll be well on your way of boiling water. That's how much heat is required to just melt one kilogram of ice. To give you an, to give you an idea of how expensive heating and, and, that, and, that's, and that is melting. That's not even heating. Heating would be even more intense. I mean, vaporizing would even be more intense. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, Now the um, now so this actually uh, causes a a lot of uh, interesting um, interesting phenomena because of how expensive uh, uh, this kind of a phase change is. So I'll give me an example. All right. So as an example, you know, these phase changes So phase changes uh, have a tremendous stabilizing effect. Um, uh, uh, even at even at temperatures that are not near the melting point and melting and boiling points. Okay, and what I mean by that is that it's really because um, evaporation condensation occur even temperatures below the boiling point.
So even if uh, the, the system would tend to have a, a you know, a, a generally ha ha tend to have a larger temperature increase, the fact is, if, if this goes into condensation or evaporation, that causes a stabilizing effect because, because when you evaporate a, a, even a small amount of water, you take, you essentially take a lot of energy out of the system. And that system, that energy cannot, can then not be used to actually increase the temperature. So, so there's a stabilizing effect in that. You're, you're not gonna get overly large temperatures because, condens uh, because you know, evaporation and condensation occur oftentimes well below the, well below the uh, boiling point. And so, and so you're, you're constantly gonna be essentially um, bleeding off uh, energy that would otherwise go into uh, increasing the temperature. So that causes a stabilizing effect. Um, you know, so, you know, so for example, you look at like rainforest or so, you know, uh, temperatures in humid climates, You know, they rarely go um, over 35 degrees Celsius. So they rarely exceed 35 degrees Celsius. And uh, because most heat transfer goes into evaporating the water into the air. It does that as opposed to increasing the temperature. So nicely, what that does is it allows the temperature to actually be lower because evaporation is so expensive. All right. Now, um, so let me, um, now I talked about heat of vaporization and also heat of, of um, Fusion, there is, as we saw earlier, there is a possibility of going straight from the solid to gaseous phase. So, you know, for, you know, for phase transitions, we don't actually have data in the, in the tables on this, but for phase transitions, between the solid and gaseous phase directly, which again, we call sublimation. There is uh, the, so the relationship is similar. So the relationship or the heat transfer is governed by a very similar looking relationship. Q is the mass times what we call L sub S. L sub S, as you might guess, is the latent heat of sublimation. And, I, and you can look those values up someplace. They're not in the book, but you can, you can look them up in other books or maybe even your iPhone if you needed it. All right, so let's, uh, let's do some problems. All right. I wanna do OpenStax 14.11. Uh, that says, how much heat transfer
in kilocalories. Uh, is required to thaw. Um, a 0 0.450 kilogram package of frozen vegetable. Frozen. Uh, originally at zero degrees Celsius. If their heat of fusion is the same as that of water. Okay. So how much heat transfer in kilocalories is required to thaw a 0 0.4 by 0 kilogram package of frozen vegetables originally at zero degrees Celsius if their heat of fusion is the same as that of water? I guess uh, there's a question mark. All right. Okay, so let's see here. We have the mass with the heat of uh, fusion. So we gotta do, look up something. You know what it is, we've seen this value already. All right, so we're gonna be uh, making a phase change. So the heat of fusion, now, well, actually we, we want the value in kilocalories. If you look up in the table, you find out that the heat of fusion for water is 79.8 kilocalories per kilogram. That's the heat of fusion of water. All right, and the mass of this uh, package of vegetables is 0 0.450 kilograms. So simply, you just write the Q equals M L sub F. Q is a mass, 0 0.450 kilograms times 79.8. Um, oops, that's a kilocalorie. Sorry about that. Kilocalories per kilogram. And the answer would be that the heat would be 35.9 kilocalories. So there you go. The thaw that bag of vegetables. All right, let's uh, look at um, OpenStax 14.12. Okay. Um, a bag, so this is so uh, yes. So a bag containing zero degrees Celsius ice is much more effective. In absorbing energy
than one containing the same amount of zero degree Celsius liquid water. All right, so A, how much heat transfer is necessary to raise the temperature of 0 0.800 kilograms of water from 0 degrees Celsius to 30.0 degrees Celsius. And that's A, B. How much he transfer to first uh, melt zero point eight zero zero kilograms of zero degrees Celsius ice. And then raise its temperature. All right, and then C, explain Uh, how your answer supports the contention. That the ice is more effective. All right, so 14.12, open stack. So bag containing zero degrees Celsius ice is much more effective in absorbing energy than one containing the same amount of zero degrees Celsius liquid water. A, how much heat transfer is necessary to raise the temperature of 0 0.800 kilograms of water from zero degrees Celsius to 30.0 degrees Celsius? B, how much heat transfer to first melt 0 0.800 kilograms of zero degrees Celsius ice and then raise its temperature? And C, explain how your answer supports the contention that the ice is more effective. Okay, so again, it's very similar to my initial calculation about, you know, um, you know, they comparing, you know, the temperature rise um, for uh, one kilogram of ice at zero degrees Celsius liquid water compared with how much it takes to melt. 0.1 or 1, 1.0 kilograms of ice. So, all right, I'm going to erase this. So, again, a similar kind of calculation, emphasizing, you know, and how expensive it is to melt or vaporize or evaporate some, you know, uh, substance or water at least. Okay, so part A the mass is 0 0.800 kilograms. All right. And delta T 
we're going to raise it to 30 degrees Celsius. 30 degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius equals 30 degrees Celsius. And again, liquid water, we look up the subic heat as 4186 joules per kilograms uh, degrees Celsius. Okay. And so Q and is MC delta T. So it's going to be 0 0.800 kilograms times 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius times 30 degrees Celsius. When I do that calculation, I find out it's 1.00 times 10 to the fifth joules to make this happen, all right? What happens now if I melt it first, all right? And then I do this process. Well, the melting, M is 0 0.800 kilograms. Um, the heat of fusion of water, remember, is 334 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram, and that's for water. So the heat uh, for this, now if I'm gonna, if I'm going to, um, again, if I'm going to do this process plus the, the melting, the total heat for that to happen would be um, M L sub F plus M C delta T. I already did the M C delta T calculation above. So, Q would be the 0 0.800 kilograms times the, the heat of a fusion, 334 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram, and then plus MC delta T is what I calculated above, 1.00 times 10 to the fifth joules. Okay, so now, heat to make that happen is 3.68 times 10 to the fifth joules, all right? So it's about three times the value now. So you're comparing 1.00 times 10 to the fifth joules to just raise the temperature of 0 0.800 kilograms of uh, liquid water from zero degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. Here, you wanna melt, that, that ice first, and then raise the temperature by that amount. You realize it's gonna take a little over about three and a half or so, or 3.68 or so times the energy to do so. All right, so in seeing that, how would I answer part C? Well, my answer to part C would be something like the following. I would say the ice is much more effective uh, in absorbing heat because it first must be melted. Okay, um, which requires a lot of energy. Um, then it gains the same amount of heat as the bag that, that uh, started with liquid water.
the first 2.67 times 10 to the fifth joules of heat is used to melt the ice. And then it absorbs one point zero zero times uh, ten to the fifth joules of heat as liquid water. That's how I'd answer that question. So I'd say the ice is much more effective in absorbing heat because it first must be melted, which requires a lot of energy. Then it gains the same amount of heat as the bag that started with liquid water. The first 2.67 times 10 to the joules of heat is used to melt the ice. Then it absorbs 1.00 times 10 to the joules as heat as liquid water, which is all that the first bag did that started as liquid water. All right. All right. So now, um, to another problem. <sighs> Open stats fourteen point thirteen. All right, so that one says how much heat transfer. Uh, is required <clears throat> to raise the temperature of a 0 0.750 kilogram aluminum pot Uh, containing 2.5 kilograms of water. From 30.0 degrees Celsius. to um, the boiling point and then boil away uh, 0 0.7 by 0 kilograms of water. That's uh, part A. All right, part B. Ask uh, how long does this take? if the rate of heat transfer is 500 watts. All right, so how much heat transfer is required to raise the temperature of a 0.75 kilogram aluminum pot 
containing 2.50 kilograms of water from 30.0 degrees Celsius to the boiling point and then boil away 0 0.750 kilograms of water. And then B, how long does this take if the rate of heat transfer is 500 watts? All right, so we're gonna raise, and again, the, uh, the pot and the water inside the pot have to increase temperature together, okay? And so, um, all right, so let's, uh, then the rest of the heat will go into boiling away the water. All right, here we go. All right, so part A. All right, so we want, um, I'm gonna figure out how much heat it's gonna take to raise the entire system from 30 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, okay? So we'll say the Q1 is that heat. So it's gonna equal the mass of the pot times the specific heat of aluminum plus the mass of the water, or we'll say H2O, I guess, times the specific heat of liquid water, all multiplied by delta T. So there's going to be two phases. First of all, I need to raise the aluminum pot and the water all together up from 30 degrees Celsius to boiling. All right, so the, again, the mass of the pot is going to be 0 0.750 kilograms as given. The mass of the water is going to be 2.50 kilograms. Okay, and we're not even going to worry about um, about boiling quite yet. We're just going to raise the entire system together. So the specific heat of water again was. 4186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. The specific heat, again, you can look this up in the table of aluminum is 900 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. All right. We're just going to raise within phase. We're, we're not going to change any phase. We're just going to raise the pot and the water inside the pot together. And they must be raised together because of the zero law of thermodynamics. All right, so um, delta T, by the way, is 30 degrees. I'm sorry, 70 degrees. It's gonna be 100 degrees Celsius minus 30 degrees Celsius, which is 70 degrees Celsius, all right? So I have everything I need. So I'm gonna calculate Q1 is gonna be the heat necessary to take the entire system from 30 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, okay? So again, no, no boiling of any kind yet. All right, so here we go. Q1 is going to be uh, bracket mass of the pot, uh, 0 0.750 kilograms. The specific heat of aluminum, 900 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius plus the specific heat of the water inside the pot, 2.50 uh, kilograms, and the specific heat of water, 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. All of that is multiplied by 70 degrees Celsius, and the delta T, okay? Q1, that heat I find to be 7.80 times 10 to the joules. And that's the amount of heat necessary to take the entire system. So again, this, this is the heat. Take a loop, uh, so this is the pot plus water system. together. From zero degrees Celsius, I'm sorry, 30 degrees Celsius 
to 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so the whole system must be raised together. Now we still need to boil away um, 0 0.750 kilograms of water. It's a different process now. Now the entire system is at 100 degrees Celsius. At this point, all of the heat is going to go to evaporating water. So no, no, no temperature change occurs in the system. All of it now goes into evaporating water. Okay, so just kind of keep keep tabs of this number and put it. And I'll put it in the parking lot. So this Q1, let's kind of keep, keep track of this. So again, part A is over. I'm gonna to go to part B, Q1. I'm sorry, um, this is still part A. <laughs> Q1 is 7.80 times 10 to the fifth joule. All right, so we'll, park, we'll put this in the parking lot. Okay, we need more energy. So we need to now evaporate 0 0.700 kilograms of water. Okay, so, so now we need to evaporate 0 0.700 kilograms of water. So evaporate, so let Q2, so at this point, so at this point, So at this point, the system, the entire system is at 100 degrees Celsius, okay? All heat entering the system. will now be used to evaporate water. No more temperature increase, okay? So we're gonna find out that Q2 is the additional energy, additional heat needed that will rate, that'll evaporate water, all right? And so we will let that be, um, I'll say, M2 times L sub V. M2 is this amount of energy to evaporate the water. That's 0 0.750 kilograms. That's the steam. L sub V is the latent heat of vaporization of water. Look that up. That's 22. Uh, 2256 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram. That is a tremendous amount of energy. Q2 will be 0 0.750 kilograms times 2256 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram. Q2 will then be. Um, 1.69 times 10 to the six joules. And there's more energy required, a lot more energy required to just evaporate that 0 0.75 kilograms of water than to take the entire aluminum pot plus water system uh, from 30 degrees Celsius to, 70, to 100 degrees Celsius. More energy is required to, for the evaporation process. So what's the total heat required to do this job? Well, the total heat required, you know, again, energy is just add, right? So it's going to be Q1 plus Q2. So that'll be 7.80 times 10 to the fifth joules plus 1.69 times 10 to the sixth joules. And that'll be 2.47 times 10 to the sixth joules. That is the total heat required to do this job, to raise the aluminum pot and water from 30 degrees Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius and then boil away 0 0.7 by 0 kilograms of water in this process.
Now, part B says, how long does this take if, if, if the power, you know, if the heat and going through the system is at 500 watts, all right? So we got this energy, we got this heat, so keep that in mind, okay? And then we're gonna erase, I'm gonna erase this and do the second part, which is not too that bad of a calculation. All right, so part B is ask how long does this take? Well, remember the power is generally given as the work over the time, but we can call that the heat over the time um, from the mechanical equivalent of heat. All right, so great. So what that then means is how much time is required. Well, I know that P is 500 watts. And I just got done computing the total heat required, and that was 2.47 times 10 to the six joules. So essentially I can just exchange partners here that T would then be Q over P or 2.47 times 10 to the six joules divided by 500 watts. We'll find out that the time will be 4,940 seconds. I don't know about you, but that doesn't really make much sense to me. I, I, I can't picture what that is. So I'm gonna convert that to minutes. So I'll say, well, you know, one minute has 60 seconds. And it turns out the time required for this whole process will be 82.3 minutes. All right, 82.3 minutes is the answer. Or I suppose you could put 49, 40 seconds, but again, that doesn't, I like to have my physics calculations make sense. That's why I do that. So again, that's how long it took. All right, um, another problem. The only way to get good at physics is doing problems, right? So do another problem here. I'm gonna do open stacks 14.19. All right, this says, uh, how many grams of coffee must evaporate from three, 350 grams of coffee From 95 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. Oh, sorry. Of, uh, yeah. So again, how many grams of coffee must evaporate from 350 grams of coffee in a 100 gram glass cup? Sorry about that. In a 100 gram glass cup. Um, to cool the coffee. from 95.0 degrees Celsius to 45.0 degrees Celsius. You may assume uh, that the coffee has the same thermal properties as water.
Okay. And that the average heat of vaporization Uh, is 2340 kilojoules per kilogram. Or if you want to do kilocalories, 560 calories per gram. Um, in parentheses, it says you may neglect the change in mass. Uh, of this coffee, Which will give it, which will give you an answer that is slightly larger than correct. All right, so what's the saying? And so how many grams of coffee uh, must evaporate from a 350 grams of coffee in a 100 gram glass cup to cool the coffee from 95.0 degree, degrees Celsius to 45.0 degrees Celsius? You may assume that the coffee has the same thermal properties as water, and the average heat of vaporization is 2340 kilojoules per kilogram, or 560, kil 560 kilo, uh, calories per gram. You may neglect the change in mass of this coffee, which will give you and answered as slightly larger than correct. Now, what I like about this problem is it gives you an example of, you know, kind of like how nature works. Nature will evaporate to kind of, to kind of cool, to cool, uh, to, to cool the system. So you notice that, you're going to notice that you evaporate off a little bit of coffee, it's not much. You evaporate off a little bit of coffee, and the result is going to be a, a, a relatively large amount of, of a decre decrease in temperature. And you do that by evaporating coffee, just like just like we kind of discussed previously by the stabilizing effect um, that evaporation has, because it is so it is so uh, expensive heat wise. All right, so let's uh, work this problem. Okay, so. What I'm gonna say is the heat gained in evaporating the coffee equals um, the heat leaving the coffee and glass to lower its temperature. All right, so in equation form, what does that say? I'm gonna let capital M be the mass of the, I'm gonna let capital M be the mass of evaporated coffee. So M L sub V, that's basically the heat 
that's basically uh, that's taken to evaporate a mass of, cap of capital M of coffee, which I'm looking for actually, is going to equal what? It's going to equal the mass of the coffee, which we're going to assume constant, times the specific heat in this case of coffee, which would be in this case water. We're going to assume it has the properties of water, plus the uh, mass of the glass. and the specific heat of glass, all right, times delta T. Now, delta T in this case is what? It's 95 degrees Celsius minus 45 degrees Celsius, right? And so what I wanna do then is, I to, for me to solve this, I'm gonna divide by L sub V. So if I want to find this mass, now I'm just going to do a little algebra one here and divide all of this by L sub B. So I did a little tricky algebra there. You can't do this. I'm just doing kind of the same line. And there's L sub B. That's really what I want to solve for. And what's left is just plugging in the numbers. So I'll plug in numbers up here. So the mass of the evaporated coffee. All right, so the mass of the coffee, we're told is 0 0.350 kilograms. The specific heat of water, 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius, plus the mass of the glass, 0. 100 zero zero kilograms times the specific heat of glass, which is going to be 840. Again, you have to look this up. Joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. You know, all of this multiplied by, so again, 95 minus 45. So I can fit this here, yeah. 95 degrees Celsius minus 45 degrees Celsius. Okay. And all of this is divided by the specific heat of vaporization, or sorry, the heat of vaporization. And that was given to us specifically as 2340 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram. And if I do that, I find that the mass of this evaporated coffee is 0 0.033 kilograms, <clears throat> which is maybe more appropriately 33 grams. So if I evaporate off 33 grams of coffee, I can cool the system down from 95 degrees Celsius or the coffee plus glass system down from 95 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. Okay, I, let's see here. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do two more problems and now we'll call it a, a done deal. This next problem is not gonna be too long and the last problem is gonna be a little bit lengthy. All right, two more problems. I mean, all I'm doing here is uh, the only way to get good at physics is doing problems. So again, opus X 14.21. All right, so what is this? The energy released from condensation and thunderstorms. This is a good, this is a very interesting problem. The energy released in cond from condensation. from thunderstorms, you know, good problem for Texans. We have pretty big, uh, pretty big thunderstorms here. Can be very large.
And that's because of the tremendous expense of you know, evaporation. Calculate, or condensation, calculate the energy released. Uh, into the atmosphere. For a small storm. Of radius one kilometer. Assuming that 1.0 centimeter of rain is precipitated uniformly over this area. All right, so this says, the energy release and condensation from thunderstorms can be very large. Calculate the energy release into the atmosphere for a small storm of radius one kilometer, assuming that 1.0 centimeters of rain is precipitated uniformly over this area. And I think this answer will surprise you. You, know, you get these extremely large thunderstorms over Texas, especially in the springtime. That's just a little thunderstorm. And we'll see what kind of tremendous amount of energy is actually released from just a little thunderstorm. All right, so um, so what are we looking for? Well, we're talking about a storm. We're gonna assume it has a circular area. It's gonna cover some sort of an area. So the area is simply gonna be pi r squared, okay? And um, r is a kilometer, so it's a thousand meters. So pi times a thousand meters squared. And we find out that the area of the thunderstorm is 3.14 times 10 to six meters squared. We're now going to assume that um, one centimeter of rain has covered this area. All right. And so again, um, zero point, or so we'll say D is a thickness. D is 0 0.01 meters of rain, of water. Okay. Uh, is condensed over this area. That's how much rain dropped out. So what kind of volume are we talking about now? What volume of water has been precipitated? Well, volume is A, D. The area of the circle plus the thickness, D. Well, that'll be 3.14 times 10 to the sixth meters squared times the thickness of just a centimeter. And that'll give us 3.14 times 10 to the fourth meters cubed. What am I after? Well, I'm after the mass of the water, right? So the mass is in fluid mechanics is always density, the density of the water times the volume. So the density of water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed times the volume of the water, 3.14 times 10 to the fourth meters cubed. I find out that the mass of the water that has been released is 3.14 times 10 to the seventh kilogram. All right, so this has all been done through the extremely expensive process of condensation. So the heat that is required to do that is um, the mass. Can you put that light back on, please? Thank you. Uh, the mass times the heat of vaporization. All right, so heat of vaporization is expensive. So we have 3.14 times 10 to the seventh kilograms. 
times 2256 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram. Again, that huge number. We find out that the heat that is released to the atmosphere is 7.08 times 10 to the 10th, or sorry, 10 to the 13th joules. And that's about the energy released from the first atomic bomb, which is about the energy released. by the first atomic bomb, or the first, I'd say, nuclear bomb. That's just from a very small thunderstorm. So I figure out the area of this thunderstorm. I know that we're talking about a storm of radius one kilometer. I figured out that, you know, we're, we're gonna say that just about a centimeter of rain was condensed. The volume of this rain, we multiply V as A times C, the mass is the density times the volume. We find the mass. And then we found the heat released from condensation. That's the mass of the rain times the heat of vaporization. You find out that this tremendously large number, 7.0 to the center of 13 joules, which is about the energy release in the first nuclear bomb. But that's just the energy released from a small thunderstorm. You can only imagine how much energy is released in one of the real monster storms or the supercells, for instance. All right, I'm gonna do one more problem for this video. That'll be it. Open stacks 14.24. All right, a 0.0500 kilogram ice cube. At negative 30.0 degrees Celsius. Very, very cold. Is placed And 0 0.400 kilograms of 35.0 degrees Celsius water. In a very well insulated container. Um, what is the final temperature? Now, this looks like an innocent enough problem. This problem is going to be, um, there's going to be a lot of details in this problem. So again, what you have is 0 0.050 0 kilograms ice cube, very, you know, that's at negative 30 degrees Celsius, very, very cold ice cube. Is placed in 0 0.400 kilograms of 35 degrees Celsius water, pretty warm, you know, very warm water. Uh, in a very well insulated container, it means you're not going to have leakage of heat anywhere. Anywhere. What is the final temperature? That means you have you have accurate heat transfer calculations. All right. So we're going to have a multi-phase process. Okay. And and, and so um, okay. So what's going to have to happen now is the ice cubes are going to want to have some sort of thermal equilibrium. The ice cube is going to want to heat up. The ice cube is going to heat at an MC delta T kind of a relationship in order to get it to the to the uh, to the freezing point of water. I'm sorry, yeah, the freezing point of water. Right now, it's well below freezing. So you're going to have to have the MC delta T linear relationship, and that heat would be at the expense of the surrounding water. All right. So so basically. 
uh, in general. All right, well, again, in general, you have a cold object. Uh, is inserted into a, a mass of hotter liquid. Heat transfer from the hotter liquid to the colder object will occur until the two have the same temperature, usually. Well, you might have a phase change. And that's thermal equilibrium. Okay, now, you know, again, this is the condition of thermal equilibrium. So that's what's actually going to happen. But through some phase changes, too. All right, so in general, if a cold object is inserted into a mass of a hotter liquid, heat transfer from the hotter liquid to the colder object will occur until the two have the same temperature, which is the condition of thermal equilibrium. I mean, we discussed this earlier with the operation of a thermometer, for instance. All right, now that's true. Uh, in this case, though, however, Um, for this case, uh, the ice will most likely melt and the thermal equilibrium would have to be achieved Um, between the colder mass of melted ice um, and the warmer surrounding water. All right, so we're gonna to have to do this in stages, basically. So let's first of all, bring the ice to uh, the melting point. The first thing we need. And again, any kind of energy that is, any kind of heat that is received by the ice is gonna be at the expense of the surrounding water, all right? So, so again, so first thing I wanna ask is how much energy Um, is required to uh, take the ice uh, 
from negative 30 degrees Celsius, zero degrees Celsius. And so I'm going to do the linear relationship to get the ice to the freezing point. Okay, that's the first thing. We'll call that Q1. So Q1 is going to be M ice, C ice, delta T. All right, Q1 will be the mass of the ice. It's 0 0.0500 kilograms. The specific heat of ice is 2090 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. And I and we're gonna raise from 30 degrees Celsius, I'm sorry, from zero minus negative 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, when you do that calculation, you find out that the energy required for this to occur is 3135 joules. Again, this is just in phase uh, heat transfer required to take the ice from negative 30 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. So this is entirely in the solid phase. Okay, the ice gains heat at the expense of the surrounding water, liquid water. Okay, and so, so essentially, that liquid water, that Q1 I just got done computing, is going to be at a loss of energy with liquid water. So it's so I, I so given that's a loss, I will call this negative m water. And when I say water, I mean liquid water, sea water times. And I'll call this a new temperature of the water, T1 minus 35 degrees Celsius. T final minus T initial. Again, it's, it was initially um, it's, it was initially 35 degrees Celsius, and then it's going to go to a temperature of T1. So again, this particular relationship has got a hold. So the heat that was gained by the ice in order to take it from negative 30 degrees Celsius over to the, the freezing point, zero degrees Celsius, is at the expense, at the loss of the surrounding liquid water. Okay, T1 is then the new temperature uh, that, that uh, results from that, all right? And so let me erase some of this up here. So again, this is the first stage. The first stage is basically taking the ice to the freezing point, all right? And so if I solve this, I can I can basically say, well, let's see here. I have um uh let's see here. Uh, if I solve this algebraically, I find so I'm gonna basically divide by negative m water. Well, I'm gonna multiply through by the negative. That becomes negative t1 and then uh, plus 35. And then essentially I can I can solve for t1. And when I do this, I find out that T1 is going to be 35 degrees Celsius, okay, minus Q1 divided by M water, C water. And you can do the algebra yourself. Okay. And so, um, so divide by M water, C water. And then add to 35, this is going to become negative. There you go. So now, so T1 will be 35 degrees Celsius minus this 3135 joules divided by the mass of the surrounding water, which is 0 0.400 kilograms 
times the specific heat of water or liquid water, 4186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. When I do that calculation, I find out that the new temperature of the surrounding water becomes 33.13 degrees Celsius. So for the ice to be taken to its freezing point, um, the surrounding water loses heat and it goes from 35 degrees Celsius now to 33.13 degrees Celsius. That's only in the first stage, okay? So right now the surrounding water is at T1, is 33.13 degrees Celsius. Okay, now we have to melt the ice. So now the ice is, the ice has been taken from negative 30 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. It is still solid. The next stage would be to melt the ice. Okay, so we're gonna melt the ice now and figure out how much heat that takes, that requires. So we're gonna, we're gonna now melt the ice. Okay, so that's, we'll call that Q2. So the amount of heat required to do that will be M ice, uh, this spe specific heat of fusion of water. So Q2 will be, again, this um, small amount of ice, 0 0.0500 kilograms times 334 times 10 to the negative 10, sorry, 10 to the third joules per kilogram. And I'll find out that the heat required now to melt this ice is going to be 1.67 times 10 to the fourth joules. And again, that is at the expense of the surrounding water. Okay. So the question now is, you know, the, the energy required to melt the ice is uh, at the expense of the surrounding water. at temperature T1. Okay, so I would then say that on that Q2, again, the negative, because it's a loss. Okay, negative what? Um, M water, C water. And then multiply by T2 minus T1. So T2, so again, T5 minus the initial. The new temperature of this running water will then become T2. Okay? So I got to work that calculation out. Well, I know what Q2 is. It's this 1.67 times the fourth. All right? And so let's work that out now. So if I do that and I do the algebra, I will find out that T2 is equal to uh, T1 minus Q2 divided by M water, C water. So T2 is 33.13 degrees Celsius minus this large value, 1.67 times 10 to the fourth joules divided by the mass of the water, surrounding water, 0 0.400 kilograms times seawater, which is again, 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. And if I do that calculation, I find that my T has gone down quite a bit. T2 ends up at 23.16 degrees Celsius. So that process costs about 10 degrees. 
to, you know, to the uh, surrounding water. But we're not done yet. Now we have a little patch of very cold zero degree Celsius water and the surrounding water at 23.16 degrees. Okay, so at this point, what we have to say is now we have the heat transfer from um, or transferred into cold water into patch of cold water at zero degrees Celsius equals um, the heat transferred from the surrounding water. At T2 equals 23.16 degrees Celsius, all right? So now we have a heat transfer problem between liquid water and liquid water at this point. Ice is all gone, all right? So this point, remember this number here, 23.16 degrees. At this point now, it, the calculation is fairly simple. What we're gonna say is, well, we're going to imagine that the mass of the cold water times the specific heat of water, now C water, times what? Now our final temperature is going to be T3. So now the cold water is going to be its final temperature T3, its initial temperature is zero. Remember, it's starting now at zero degrees. It's zero degrees Celsius patch of water. That gain is gonna be at the loss of the surrounding water. So I would call that M water, the surrounding water now, C water times T3 minus T2. Okay, so it, it starts at T2 and they both will end up at T3. That, that will be when the entire water is at the same temperature, that will be the thermal equilibrium. That is when the heat transfer stops, according to the zero flaw of thermodynamics. Okay. And then what's nice here is that I can actually cancel out C water because now both of these are liquid water. So that can now be canceled out. So what I then have is M cold times T3 is um, negative. So it's going to be um, uh, M water T2 minus M water T3. I have to solve this now. And again, I'm, of course, I'm going to solve for T3. So put everything together as T3. So put the uh, T3. Uh, algebraically over, so I have M cold plus M water. All that's multiplied by T3 is equal to M water times T2. Solve for T3. T3 is M water T2 divided by the combination M cold plus M water. Okay, and at this point, I'm ready to plug in numbers. So, um, <clears throat> number, plug in numbers, you have T3. Okay, the mass of the surrounding water, 0 0.400 kilograms times the the initial, uh, the temperature of the uh, warmer water before this particular process started. And again, that was 23.16 degrees Celsius. And that's divided by the mass of the cold water, which was original ice, 0 0.0500 kilograms plus 0 0.400 kilograms 
And finally, the entire system is at an equilibrium temperature of 20.59 degrees Celsius. So really, these uh, problems end up becoming uh, accounting problems, if you will. I mean, they essentially you're just keeping track of all all of this energy and and, and this um and eventually you know the idea is you're going you're ending up at a final equilibrium temperature for the water. So with that said, um, I am now officially done with uh, the chapter twelve lecture on. Uh, temperature and heat.